I've been through a lot, I've seen a lot, I've lived a lot of lives. You can't live in the darkness forever. And no matter what happens, you, you've got to keep moving forward. Right? You've got to keep moving forward. But the adrenaline that I get from acting, it's, it's unreal, mate. I can't describe it. I'm like floating in the water there. This big angry swan here. And I was like, uh, and it had its, and it had its babies around him. So it was obviously yeah. in protective yeah. mode. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I really didn't think this through. And I was like, now I just look stupid on camera. Art is about breaking boundaries. It is all about breaking boundaries. That's what all of our favorite artists did. They were talking about Shaun of the Dead, remaking Shaun of the Dead. Are you fucking stupid, mate? They are talking about remaking Scarface, the ultimate, the original rise and fall gangster film. You want to remake that? Man, I've been through shit. My life is tragedy, right? My life is tragedy and I, I can project that easily. And I actually struggle more with the comedy aspect. I struggle, I can cry on cue better than I can laugh on cue. Sometimes I, if I'm in a moment, there's a catalyst, a switch in me, which says, go all the way. Like, Mm -hmm. see where that goes, feel it. Mm. And I think that's the unhealthy side of acting. And that's what I'm talking about, it's in the text. That those words just resonated with me so hard and that just lit something up in me, man. And mm. ever, ever since then, I, that's when I knew. And I was like, that, and that, that was when the truth finally started to pierce through into my work. Half the actors you see that are in those Mate, they're on steroids. Mate. No, of course. They are on steroids, and it's so annoying when they try and downplay it, and the studios try and downplay it. I'm not fucking lunatic because the first ever steroid I touched was Tren, and Tren's crazy. Like, yeah. Tren is the, the, is the wardrobe because he's the invisible man, but he's just bollock naked, and we all have to convolute in the fact that he is invisible because it will hurt his feelings. Hmm. We've invented a new format, and people will copy it 100%, just like they copied mockumentary formats. Yeah. But I was going to quit in January, man. Yeah. I, I was fully going to quit. My name is Andrew Argozin and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is my good friend, actor, writer, Elliot Ethan. All right, look, man, I have known you for what, like probably three, four years from working at the studio? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And it's good to finally have like a proper, proper chat, you know, about stuff. Let's start in the beginning. What was your childhood like and how did you end up in this profession of constant rejection? I don't know, man. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky one because I didn't have the greatest childhood, if I'm honest. Because um, when I was a baby, uh, I lost my mum to leukemia. Mm. Um, and then it was left up to my dad to look after us, um, me and my brother, um, who sadly passed away when he was 19 in a car accident. Shit, so it's been, it's, been a lot of, it's been a lot of trauma and a lot of trouble. Um, my dad's been through it all and yeah, uh, and now, now he's not well, so it's all going full circle. But all, all I've learned through this life is that I've got to deal with my adversities and try and try and move forward and just make me into a stronger person, basically. Yeah. So yeah. That's, well, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Yeah, yeah, it's that old, that old chestnut. But it's easier said than done. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong, I have my mad moments and that. And it's, it's, it, I've, I've had a strange life because I've lived in and out of privilege, as you can see right now, in privilege. Like, and, and there's been other moments in my life that have not been like that at all. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been weird getting to this point. And I'd say the, the, doing this thing where we constantly get rejected is actually mm -hmm. the thing that grounds me and keeps me in place and yeah. gives me some sort of sense of purpose to keep moving. Because otherwise, I'm just fucking, <laughs> <laughs> I'm off the rails, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. Oh, it happened before. Uh, what's that? Oh, of the rails. Yeah, the yeah. Recently, I, well, this is the thing, man. I keep. I, 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 it never changes. Um, life of an addict and that. Like, I, I go through relapses all the time. I've just been through one recently. Like, I was saying to you, I've got mm. chest problems at the moment, and it's probably smoke induced because I just abuse my body, man. And mm. I've got to stop doing that. And it's been slowly happening over years, but it's because it's a cause and effect of the trauma. So, uh, it's, it's a defense mechanism. It's a comfort and. I've got to start digging myself out of my comfort zones, which is it's normally chemical comfort, and it's just not right. Like it's mm. not, it's it's not real. Whereas um, you you saw me come off stage um, about a week or two ago, and that feeling that I come off with, like you can't buy that. You can't. It's not artificial. It comes it comes from within, and that's the yeah. I'd say adrenaline's the the thing that I I yearn for the most. Adrenaline and dopamine and. I'm constantly craving it through through the addictions that I've been through. So, how did it happen? The the, the crave craving of adrenaline. 
Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a neurotransmitter. It's just like anything else. It's like serotonin. Mm. Uh, like if you like, there's artificial forms of serotonin, but if you stroke a dog, you get a natural release of serotonin. Maybe some oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical of love, and I've just heavily abused my brain with um dopamine, like just artificial dopamine. And now I just say I, I was I was always an adrenaline junkie when I was younger, and I'm still am um, now. Uh, I've got goals and ambitions of like um, jumping off cliffs. Like I, w- I want to jump off cliffs and go, like do base jumping and sh- shit like that. I've done skydiving. I was weightboarding the other week, um, and uh, I was I was hitting jumps and stuff. Like I was doing some crazy stuff that I'd never normally do. But I've got this. There's a thing in me that just I don't don't care really. I got a bit. Of, I got a bit of a death wish, I'd say, um, to to respect. But at the same time, I've got a love for life as well and a curiosity for it. So. Yeah, it's, it's strange, but the adrenaline that I get from acting, it's, it's unreal, mate. I can't describe it, and uh, I, even Freddie touched on it in his, his interview. It's just that adrenaline. I stand there, and lately I've been enjoying it. It's the whole fight or flight response, and I'd say lately I've been fighting so much more. Like before, I got literally before I come out of them curtains the other day when you saw me perform. I was behind shadow boxing. Mm. <laughs> I'm shadow boxing behind the <laughs> fucking curtain because I'm like, I'm not backing down. Like, I'm not backing down, mate. Like, and that was a big, big um, step for me. That was one of the hardest things I've had to do in a long time. Yeah. And um, it's I come out of it bulletproof. That's how I felt. Like I, I did my job. I know I did my job. I, I probably need to work on my stagecraft a bit more. Like my projection, my um, presenting myself to the audience a bit better. There's always refinement to be made within the acting craft. It's never, you never smash it completely out of the park. I think the people that do that in my eyes, they've had a long time in the game and they, they're they refining. And they're touching on what Freddie said again, like I had I had that moment um, today, like he says in the shower, you think of you think of things and, and, and stuff like that. And I think that's the difference between a well-seasoned actor and us that are still sort of new to the game. I think I, they, they've got that level of intuition and I feel I'm slowly building it up. I would argue with that because yeah. I think, I don't remember whose book I was reading, uh, was it Stella Adler? Like, I don't know, but someone who has been in the game for like decades and decades and they were saying that sometimes you do a show like a full season and then only by the end of the season you finally realize oh well that's how that's what the scene is about that's how it can play that's how it actually can feel inside of this scene like this, this is and then it's kind of the the last couple of <laughs> couple of uh, performances and that's it so i think it's uh, everyone is on this journey not yeah. just not just people like us who are like less uh, experienced than you know some people who've been like yeah. in the game all their lives. Like everyone is kind of still still gets the discoveries, and uh, but by the end of the run, sometimes yeah. It's, uh, the the point that I, the only point I was making there was more. It's more about intuition, mm-hmm. and I think it's just and, and we know it through like acting and that before we approach a scene, it's it's, it's heavily intuitive, like based, and that, and that's what I'm saying. I feel I just feel like more more seasoned actors. Their intuition's just yeah, it's ready, it's ready yeah. to go, and I just don't feel like mine is fully there yet, mm. and that's the only point I'm making in that. And I feel like that's what every actor is striving for. Yeah, I was watching a scene with Han Solo, you know Han Solo before he goes in the uh, carbonite, and he goes, "I love you, I know." Like that was an improv line, and I saw his whole like impetus behind that, yeah. and I was like, "Yeah, that fully makes sense to the character." Like, and that, that's what I mean. <laughs> but it's these bold choices, and yeah. lately. I've not had the balls to make some bold choices that I want to make because I don't feel like I'm that in that point in the game yet because I've still got to pay some dues and I don't, I don't want people to think I'm being egotistical and mm-hmm. it's, it's a tricky one, man. Like, it also it, depends on, on the situation that you're in. Like if it's environment just in general, like very kind of open for you to be more playful and experimental if you have time for yeah. this as well, so then, then yeah, it's, it's, it's I've different. got to do that on stage. Like all three of those nights that I was on stage, now I've seen, I now I see what it's about. It's not, it's not, it's the stuff that Lee taught us, isn't it? It's like, it's not about orchestrating it. It's like, to, to, you can't, you got to just let it be. You got to let it be. And that's what I realized in the second performance was I was constricting it again. I was orchestrating it too much and I was like, 
and, and I was fading off the audience too much and I wasn't present in the moment. And then by the third show, I was like, oh shit, I've got it now. And I just literally had to just fully give myself to the piece. Mm. And then it became something more beautiful. Look, I, the, if we're talking about this particular performance right now, let's just discuss it in more details because I, I watched it. I really enjoyed it. I think it was very funny. It was like a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, left turns and right turns and U-turns. And that was, it, 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 it caught me off guard quite, quite a few times. So I really enjoyed it. But like, tell me more about the project. Like how, how did it happen? How did you find it? Who wrote it? Yeah, it's, it's mercurial and it's that for a reason. It's what you said, twists and turns. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. Because that's what it is. It's a, it's a mood shift. That's mm -hmm. what the show was meant to do. The previous show, it's been, it's been through two versions. That was the second version. And that was, um, first version was very disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I played a necrophiliac and it was, it was very fucked up, man. Like, but, and I had to push myself, but I managed to convince the audience of that. And that was a test. And this one was a test because it was so multi-layered. The characters were so multi-layered. And it was so fucking difficult to get it to a point of like truth. Like uh, that's that's all I'd say. And I met I met Rosie through um do, doing a, a scratch night at a cockpit theatre um, with with Miranda. Like we we both know Miranda, great writer, great actor, and we did a really good performance on that stage. And that's what impressed Rosie to the point where she wanted to work with me. And I saw her performance, and I walked straight up to her, and I was like, that was mad. Like what you do is crazy because she this is what she likes to do. She likes to turn your stomach like that's her that's her style that's what she goes for and then we just got on we went and did a, a scratch night at a salon salon you know it's a, how you say cheers in irish no so I it's, don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's an irish um yeah. uh, like a uh, hub basically like they only really let the only reason i was allowed to go perform there is because rosie's half irish so we performed there, that went well, got a good reception. And then we did it again at Arrowhead, which is um, Lambda, Lambda mm -hmm. Theatre. Uh, we did it there, got a good reception again. I wasn't overly happy with that, my performance in that anyway. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it developed again because Rosie did a night at Riverside and she's a, she's a mad cunt, mate. <laughs> she, I see her do a, um, a, a 60 minute show by herself. Oh my God. It was insane. Like, yeah. I, can't, I can't fathom what she did. And that was when I saw levels and I was like, but I, I witnessed her do it. I witnessed her do it. And I was like, I can do that. Like, I, can, mm -hmm. I know I can do that. Any and of she, us, any, the, any does of she us write do her that. material all the time? Uh, this time it wasn't her. She learned, she learned an hour's worth of material and she was talking from start to finish and it wasn't even her text and she learned it in two weeks. Blew my two fucking mate, it blew my mind. And oh. I'm going crazy over 46 pages in the space of, uh, I had to learn that in about a couple of weeks. And when I kept telling myself, I was like, this is less than what she had to do. And I was like, this is nothing like this. And that's what you got to do. And that's what I mean. I've done that. And that is one of the hardest things I've had to do today. And now that is, a, I've set the bar somewhere but there's still space above it. <laughs> no, but still, like, it, it, yeah. it, it, it's a step. It's a step that, like, yeah. you know, like, I did that, so this is already, like, you already know, like, okay, I actually can do that if yeah. I need to. And that's yeah. it. She inspired me. And then, uh, luckily enough, she turned around to me because um, we know a girl called Julia that helped uh, help us put it on, on the Arrowhead Theatre. And she just loved it, man. And mm -hmm. she wanted to take it and uh, do something with it. And then they got these connections with the Riverside now. And we got put onto that Bite Size Festival. And it was one of the best experiences of my life, mate. Like, nice. I really, I'm, I'm really glad I did it. But I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, my health's suffering for it now from all the stress and that, yeah. but I got out of the other end of it. But like you said, it just makes us stronger, man. Like it, it makes us stronger every single time. So. Mm. How did you get into acting? What was your first experience? How, like, why? Why? I, but I worked. I worked with this director called uh, Solomon Lichon, and he um, he does a lot of music videos for like big major artists. And you worked with him as? Um, it was basically. I was. I was actually in a. This is because I was in a low state of my life. Like I was not in a good place. I was um, hanging around with the wrong people. Um, a, a friend of mine, she she knew this as well, and uh, she she was getting into modelling, and she was just always on my case. Like mm -hmm. she was just like, you should model, you should model. Like, they were mainly on about my cheekbones and that. And, it, You're a good looking it, it, guy. But I didn't I didn't feel that way at school. People at school didn't make me feel that way. Um I actually felt ugly up until probably the age of twenty one. And then uh, she put some confidence in me and she was like, No, like and I, I was like, Okay. She sent me to an agent and I just couldn't believe it all because in my head I was just like, I just, I, I, was like, I just can't see myself like that. And um, after time, I just started to realize, oh, I am that. Mm. People, were, people were putting me down back in the past because they just didn't like me. It was like elements of jealousy and that. And I was, 
I was a bit of a little shit as well. So like, <laughs> it, it's probably their way of spiting me. I don't know, but it, it, it took me a while to develop my confidence, man. Like I had no confidence that the modeling helped boost it. But at the same time, it's not me. It's not me. And they kept sending me to these, um, the, these, uh, commercials and stuff and they just realised like I'm just not up to scratch like I haven't got that ability I started at Identity but my first ever proper modelling job was this music video with this mm. Solomon Lichelm and I was playing a, a crackhead and uh, it was a really beautiful song man and it's so messed up because technically that um, that that video hasn't been released and but it is it's on his website but he told me there on the spot and he said, like, you should be an acting man. And I was like, really? He goes, like, yeah, you've got, you got like, a natural gift for it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Um, but there was no dialogue through that. But, uh, yeah, and that, that sparked something in me. And then when I went to go join with Identity, they put me straight into the intermediate group, which I was baffled by because I was like, I didn't know how to learn lines in that. And for about two years, I'd say I'd rock up to jobs, I'd rock up to classes, and I did not know my lines. I was not professional. I, was, um, I wasn't taking it seriously. Um, because I, I saw how the modeling industry works within the film industry and I don't agree with it, man. Like I, I got looked at for so many things with no skill set whatsoever, just purely based on looks. Like I almost got cast in a lead in the, a, a film that did quite well. And ironically, I almost got cast again when I was on the set because the lead turned up and he'd had a haircut when he shouldn't. And then they got me to read lines but I couldn't get off book. Like there's an other guy and he got off book in a second. It's a page of text. Now I look at a page of text, I laugh at it. I'm like, that's nothing, mate. <laughs> and I wish I had the skill back then because I would have, it would have opened doors for me a bit more. I had a lot of opportunities at the start and now they, they're far, they're, they're far and few compared. Yeah. But that was through the modeling game. And I just don't, I don't know. I feel like there are some models out there that can do it, um, but I feel like it is a bit unfair because I feel like a lot of actors aren't getting seen to, and there's a lot of but skilled still, people out like there. Like at the same time, you like if you have the skill, if you had the skill back then, you wouldn't be just a model. You would be a model and an actor because you have the skill. You can you can you, you can memorize the lines. You can you can yeah. act because I don't think it's very rarely like they can take you for the role if you can't act just for the looks because well they will lose money. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's what, what the only thing that spur, that's that's the thing that spurred me on was um they would always say whenever I entered a room or I did something they go you got a raw talent they say it's raw yeah it's raw it needs I agree to be, with that it needs to be refined and and I was like okay and I felt it because man I've been through shit my life is tragedy like my life is tragedy and I I can project that easily with ease and that's mm -hmm. why. Um, but it hurts at the same time. Don't get me wrong; it's difficult. But it's, it's e I, thought, I think it's easier for me than it is for other people because I've lived through tragedy, so I know where it is. And I actually struggle more with the comedy aspect. I struggle. I can cry on cue better than I can laugh on cue, which is fucked. <laughs> like, and I really think about that sometimes. Mm. I, I really, I've got to feel the, the the that that joy or whatever that feeling is in order to actually laugh properly because. Mm. We do it now. Like you must mentally, we talk about mentally logging certain moments in life and being like, that's how I do that. That's how I do that. So that's what I should project into my performances. Mm. And that's what I know what my laughter sounds like. I can't do it on the spot. <laughs> and it's, it, it baffles me. And that's something I'm working on right now. Yeah. But I, I, it, I think a lot of it is based on consumption, man. It's, it's based on what you consume. And I didn't want to believe it before, but I used to listen to a lot of negative music. I used to take in a lot of negative media. And it, it was con it was consuming my soul. Like, I, I still listen to some of that stuff. I still look at some of that stuff. I appreciate it for what it is. It doesn't harm me in the way it harms others we're to the point where they don't want to look at it. But I'm, I'm ready to look at the grotesque. I'm ready to look at the dark side of life like we we like a lot of our teaching and what we've been taught is Carl Jung it's the light and the shadow I need to be in touch with my shadow in order for me to understand the light in myself yeah because one wouldn't exist without the other it is yin and yang so yeah it's, but how how do you dose this like in a way how do you understand like you know what that's 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 it now I need to go all, to all, all I consume is comedy now yeah all I consume is comedy because um but I, isn't intentional no, it is. It's yeah. fully. And I've been doing it on purpose. And I've, it's weird because I've noticed little things that um, I'm more interactive with people, man. I'm sharper. Like, I'm wittier because that's all I consume. Whereas before, all I used to consume was the, the depressing, the morbid, yeah. the, the, the deep, the, the, the dark, the, like, the angsty but sort of stuff. What pushed you before to consume the dark stuff more? Because my life was darkness. Yeah. I wanted to kill myself. Like, that's, that's the best way to describe it. Like, it's, and I, 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 I enjoyed wallowing in the self-pity. I really enjoyed it. There was a there was a catharsis in it, and um, 
I used to make music and it was very aggressive. And when I first got into acting, I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And then after a while, like you was there in class, everybody's like, we're only seeing really one side of you and mm. it's very dark. And I was like, right. And I started listening to that. And in order for me to be better at what I do, I need to get in touch with the light side of myself. And it took a long time, man. It took a long time of, um, yeah, just changing what I consume, mm. what I put in my mind, what I put in my body, the, the people I hang around with, your circle is so important yeah. and, and the laws of attraction. And now I've been focusing on that. My mind's just so much purer and better and I just, I just need to keep working on it. Mm. And that, that's all I know. I'm at, I'm at a better point than I was back then. And I don't have these dark urges and feelings like I used to, but I still have mad episodes. Like I'm definitely, like, I'm, I'm a bit crazy, man. Like, that's the best way to describe it. So. Mm. Well, it's not crazy. It's probably just a reaction to, you know, your the yeah. world around you and what happens yeah, to you. It's, cause, so it's, it's cause and effect, but it's caused me to fucking lose my mind on many occasions. And I've, I've lost my mind in this very location here where we're sitting, one of the craziest moments of my life. And I don't know. This is when I, I question whether acting's good or, or bad for me at times, because I'll be, I'll be completely honest, like this whole thing about logging uh, it, moments and stuff. Sometimes I, if I'm in a moment, there's a catalyst to switch in me, which says, go all the way. Like, Mm -hmm. see where that goes feel it mm. and I think that's the unhealthy side of acting but at the same time it's kept me it's kept me more sober it's kept me more grounded it's, it's kept, helped me project my emotions in a positive way rather than everyday people and so I, that's one thing I'm a big believer in is like I don't want to project my negativities onto other people and you can't help it because we all do it sometimes of but, course um, yeah that's the one thing I really I, I'm really trying to nip in the bud um, I'll always apologise if I do it <laughs> because I'm aware of it and uh, that's that's all I'm focusing on now is just trying to project that into into that but yeah it, I just feel like that's one of the unhealthy aspects about acting is that you might that's just me personally you you probably don't do that but I know some actors must do it man like you want to feel something I was fairly method when I started out and now I'm leaning away from the whole method stuff because mm. it shot me in the foot here and there and I don't totally agree with it yeah But I see that thing with Tom Hardy recently. I don't know if you've seen the same interview and he's just basically saying the, the method is just getting to the thing. Yeah. That's yeah, the, that's the method. It's like you can call it what you want, but we want the truth. So yeah. whatever means it, it means to get to there. It's like, but my rule is as long as it's not harming individuals around you. And I had to learn that the hard way. And now I'm, yeah, I'm still a bit of a method actor, but like I don't want to harm my, my castmates. I don't want to make them uncomfortable. I want, I want everybody in 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 the work environment to feel at ease, so we can um, so we can create. It, it was uh, it was particularly working with um, Freddie, um, Matt, and Sam. Like they really brought me down to earth, man. Like they really brought me down to earth because mm. I was just fucking. My head was just somewhere else, man. Like completely. And on work, healing Andy, yeah. Yeah, on mean? healing Andy, and uh, just work, yeah, just working with Matt in general because me and Matt work together a lot. Yeah. Um, Yeah, and it, it, I'd say it helped, that helped him a great deal. And Freddie in particular, he's, he's really helped change my outlook yeah. on, on everything. And uh, yeah, I feel a lot better now. Mm. I, I definitely do feel a lot better now about, about what I'm doing when I approach a set. The pressure, I've just relieved the pressure that I put too, too much pressure on myself to make it. And that's just not it. Yeah, so, not, I mean, that, that's the thing, because like everything that we were talking about before, Uh, you can't just do it alone. You need people around you who will help you to like and basically drag you out of this dark uh, yeah. side. So yeah, yeah, it's good that you found them. Yeah, nice. and that's why I love that's why I love acting, TV, and film and and stuff because it's collaborative shit. I started out as a painter and a draw. I'm, I'm quite good at painting and drawing. I'm not like mm. the greatest, but I've got the skill for that. Like, and the one thing that I couldn't stand about it is I'd have to lock myself in a room and just paint yeah. and, and shit and no one talk to nobody. And that's why I loved going to art university because it was a big social thing. But I knew as soon as I step out of there, I was like, I'm going to be by myself again. Or I need to join an art collective. And most artists, like painters and stuff, they don't really want to spend time with other, when they're working, they're working. And that's when I knew there was a social aspect I was missing. And that's why this just works for me. It works for me so much more. And it's the same because we've got to lock ourselves in rooms and learn lines and all for that moment, and especially with camera, like when you're doing things on screen, all of that just for that. You're sitting around on set all day for normally like all day just for fucking half an hour's work, sometimes 10 minutes work, and you just yeah. build, it's all gearing up to that moment. And but 
then when you're sitting around waiting around the set you're just chatting shit with people you're just having a laugh and networking and socializing and growing as a person and that's one 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 of the things i love about the film industry i meet some of the most fascinating people mm. you, you meet the craziest people people that don't <laughs> want to be a part of society and their <laughs> their minds are free and wacky and i love it and it's, it's they're my people definitely you know. so your choice between the screen and theater yeah I mean, when when you first met me I, I used to go around to people and go, nah, I'm a screen actor. Screen actor, I don't want to touch stage. Yeah. But now I'm seeing the, um, the benefits of it because like I said, the, my early 20s was just very anxiety driven. Probably took two years of working at work in actor's studio, watching guys like you and Freddie work That's until funny. like, no, nah, because you, you guys did give me that inspiration to keep moving. Every time I watched you guys, Sam is the reason that I'm at work in actor's studio because yeah. I went with Miranda to go see a showcase. Um, and then yeah I just see Sam on stage and I was just like something about this guy and I was like what the fuck and all the performances were good man all the performances were good but for some reason Sam just stood out and yeah. I was just like he's really cool and uh, me and Miranda sat there and went do you know what let's let's check out these classes and that was yeah. it that was it after that I just I was hooked I was I was absolutely hooked and nice. and I'll just say this yeah the, the anxiety took like two years for the anxiety to to actually lift and actually believe that I could I could do something the anxiety levels were so high when we you remember it when we used to um, record the end of the uh, the end of the class yeah that was, that was the worst bit. <laughs> like everybody hated it because we were all getting too worked up going, yeah. oh, I want a, like, I want show, good showreel material and stuff like that. And that was getting in the way of the work. Mm. And then it finally took some time to free myself of that. Yeah. And then um, the anxiety just got less and less. I, don't, I really don't get anxious when the camera's on me now. Like mm. it's, it's a strange one. I know I'm being recorded. Um, I just know I know I can do another take. Yeah, I know I can do another take. That's the thing, but like, because we always know that we can get another take, but it's not always yeah. the case. Sometimes it no. could be like, no, fucking, like yeah. just one, maybe two, and then fuck off. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, no, I know. Uh, I think it took me some time. I still uh, last year probably that I was doing the class, I kind of was way less nervous than the, all the time before. And I was more nervous in class than I was like on real actual, like, you know, shoots on the job. Yeah. <laughs> I usually, Same. if I have a job, like I, I wasn't nervous at all. The pressures and anxiety of um, class of, uh, I know if I go, I, I will go back because I'm 100% I'm going to go back. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see because the, those times I wasn't, I wasn't a working actor. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I, I was a working actor for a bit. And then, I haven't, yeah, I haven't, didn't have the chance to go back, man. There was literally no time and uh, and resources and stuff like that. And I reckon if I went back now, I'm going to be far more confident. And I'm going to, I'd say the one thing that Freddie taught me was um, choices, like just make bold choices. And he really freed up my physicality. Watch, that's one thing I really learned from watching him. Yeah. It was just, that you got you got to just be comfortable in your skin. And he, he really taught me physicalities first and foremost. When you enter that scene, it's got to be that that projects your status to the audience. And he and he showed me how to do that. And now I've got a lot more confidence in that. And uh, yeah, I just feel like I'm, I'm better at making choices now. And if I feel something or an impulse, I just follow it. Like, fuck it, mm. let's just do it. Let's get about more into details because I wanted to ask you how do you prepare for the scene, how you prepare for the role, but like, and the part of it, you say making choices, but choices in what way? Like you can't pre, pre decide how you will behave in this scene, right? Because, intuition. Because we, talk, you, we talked about intuition because earlier. Because if I react to, to what you do in a yeah. very different way that you expect it, if you will keep doing, doing the same thing, it won't make sense. So, like, what do you mean about the choice? Is like choice in the very Cho beginning choice. or a choice in general on the situation? Then you will see it's, how it's, it goes. I'd say it's in the prep. I'd say it's in the prep and. Um, one thing that I do now is uh, I actually learn my scripts in accents that are opposite to what I'm going to do them in. Yeah. So then it makes the text feel fresher. So I, it's not overworked. And when I'm playing around with that, um, uh, Beth, the director we worked on uh, Mercurial with, she's yeah. brilliant. And that was one thing she loved doing was action in the script. Like you go through your script and action it. That was the first time I physically wrote it down on the paper that intensely every single fucking line. And it really made you think. And that's one good way is action in it. And then it gives you an idea of the passage, like one passage you saw in the um, in the play. It Most of the lines t ended up being, I need to remind you. That's the action. I'm going to remind you. Mm -hmm. And that whole passage. And it, 
the moment we clocked that, it gave it gave it so much more weight. It gave it so much more weight, and uh, and I think that's why it's important to rehearse things. It is important to workshop things, and before you even shoot or perform, I think you've got to workshop the scene a little bit to get a feel for it and be like, oh, okay, shit, yeah, okay, that's that's the right thing. But it's not always the case because of budgeting or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and that's all I'd say is that. It's, it's, it's all linked to the intuition. The choices are, are linked to your intuition and you've got to trust your intuition. And, and it, like I said, it comes through practice because now I'm like, through writing these actions, sometimes we were sitting there looking at these lines and I was like, nah, there's, there's a better way of describing this. And it's like, I, um, I, I, like I'm begging you is different to I beseech to you. And that's what I'd write. And the, the difference in those words, like beseech is quite heavy. It's got a lot of weight to it. It's, it's like, so heavy. Yeah. I don't even know what it means because it, me no English. <laughs> I'm, I'm not great at English either. So I might be getting this wrong, but beseeching is like, it's almost like begging, but it's, it's, it's like, a, it's, it's quite formal. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's almost like biblical mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it, it has this feeling to it. And then when you've got those actions there, and I think that's what it is. It, it, that's another muscle memory that I need to start practicing, and so I'm ready to flex it when I when I'm there, and just have an arsenal of these actions in my head, and be like, well, I know what that line is, but it's like what we said: you've got to be in the moment. You can't be thinking about your actions too much. They just got to come intuitively in the moment as you're as you're reeling it out. But it's all about knowing the text. Yeah. You've got to know your text inside out. If you don't yeah. know your text inside out, then you're just going to be on your ass. Amen, yeah. man. Yeah. But then there's a fine line between over-prepping the text, and I'm finding that now, and that's why I do the accent thing, because then I, I don't get sick of my own voice. <laughs> that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, I understand yeah. what you mean. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for me. As I said, me no English. <laughs> so when I don't learn it like word to word, if I'll try to, you know, to say something with my own words, I'll make some stupid mistake. <laughs> so I can't do it. But it's it's definitely true. You need like I noticed you can't even start playing playing with the text if you don't know it well enough. Yeah. It's true. Like because it's, I remember when I was uh, prepping for for class for example, and then, like I know the scene, I know this, I know the scene. It's fine, and I did like fine job in the class. It was fine scene, but then if you sometimes we had this kind of like the, the the same same scene two weeks in a row, and when you know it, like because for a second on the, on the second week you really know the text, and then you suddenly start to play around with it. You, you feel like it's like almost lim limitless possibilities with the text. So do you learn the fucking text. And that's what I was saying earlier. Early on in the um, uh, when I started out, I didn't understand all that, <laughs> and I just thought I could just wing it. Yeah. And uh, I've seen actors wing it on set, and I'm like, that's not professional, man. Mm. Like it's just not. And uh, I want to be great. Yeah. I want to be great, and that is a, that's a level of the greatness. And it, it keeps script learning is just like performing. Um, I'm finding it now because you, you probably know better than most. I love a good riff. I love to riff the text, but I'm doing it less and less these days. I'm actually honoring the text more and more. I'm trying to butcher it less. And, but I think you've got to give it some of your own sauce and flavor. So it's okay to riff here, there, but not on every single line. And especially if you're on stage, it can be quite confusing for your scene partner. Yeah. So that's one thing. And, and uh, yeah, and I'm getting better at that now. And that's within the prep. That's within the prep, and I do a lot of um, learning my lines, writing them out, and that helps a lot. And, Does it? Uh, yeah. I yeah. never tried that. No, like yeah, I never, I, never understood how. Like I can show you my scroll. I've got a whole scroll of all the text yeah. that I've been learning over the years. <laughs> I've been stitching them all together, and I love looking at it, and I love going reading passages and going, "What the fuck? I, I don't remember learning this bit yeah. of text, but now it's all flooding back to me." And I'm like, "Shit! Like we got powerful brains, mate. Actors yeah. have powerful brains." And it's a muscle. Like I remember yeah. when I when I started like my very one of the first classes. I think it was intermediate. It doesn't matter. From the foundation in City Academy, I think, and we had to learn like some. Text. It was probably like three pages of text, and we had like a month. <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck out! Oh, no, yeah. it's impossible." Yeah. The more you learn, the easier it gets. Like you kind of start to realize, like I need to understand it first. I need to remember the logic of a conversation. That's much easier. And then you go for like you know word to word, you know, learning. But yeah, it's, it's still like it, it's it is it's a muscle. You need to kind of. Mm. Do it all the time. Otherwise, no, it's what, impossible. One of the hardest bits of text. I still haven't performed it. Um, I learned the uh, the dictator speech, uh, Charlie Chaplin. 
Fuck me, man. <laughs> That's a long bit of text. That's yeah. a long ass monologue, and I will attack it one day, but I've got to do it justice. And that, that was a big eye opener because I sat there and I learned that on my own steam. There was no class, there was no nothing, but that's an important thing for actors to do. If you're not, if you're not training and you're not in a class, you need to be learning text, man. You need to be forcing yourself. Not, it shouldn't be feel, feel like you're forcing it either. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find text that excites you. Yeah. And, and, and that's the one place where I'm starting to play with it. Because I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm fucking still shit scared of monologues, man. Like yeah. they're scared of, I'm getting better at them. I am getting better at them. Um, but yeah, it's just, you really got to commit to it and you got to remember your lines. But I, I see a lot of the, there's a really great Instagram page and I can't remember what it's called, but they literally um, show you some of our favorite scenes and they scroll the text yes. underneath. Never verbatim, never verbatim. Mate. The greatest scenes we've ever seen, they, they never went word for word. They had to feel it in the fucking moment. Yeah. And that's all I know. So uh, that's what, how I attack monologues now. You, uh, dual logs, I honor the text as much as possible. Once it gets the monologue, whoosh, throw that out of the fucking window. As long as I get the key points across yeah. and what the writer really wanted to say, it doesn't matter. Matthew McConaughey said it in one, once, didn't he? He goes, sometimes it can just be a look. I've seen him say that and I'm like, I don't necessarily agree with that because that might piss the writer off if you cut a whole bit of text and go, no, I'm just going to give it a look. <laughs> I don't know, man. But I think it, he also said, like, yeah. told the story when he was hired, like, he, he said, like, I was the, the second guy who thought, like, I'll just come to the set, I'll quickly look at the page and I'll learn it very quickly, like, and then I'll say it with mm. my own words. And then he comes to the set, like, looks at the page and it's different language, I think. And he was like, fuck, fuck. <laughs> You got, you got to prep. Do. You got to prep. Yeah. Like me, me and Matt do like to wing it from time to time. Cause it's good. It's good to wing it. I think there, there's there's some skill in that because um, the, yeah, we used to. You must have done it before class a few times. Learn the text on the day. Yeah. 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 We've all done it. <laughs> we've all done it. We've all done I it. And it I think there's skill in that though. I think there's skill in that. And actually, one of the things that I look at now is monologues. I don't like to overly prep them. And I'm actually so much better at monologues when I learn them on the day. Yeah. And that's so weird. And sometimes it's good to sit on them, but I've noticed some of the best monologues I performed, I didn't prep them too much. Mm. I learned them in the moment because I think if you overly over prep a text, you get bored of it. You can get bored of it and you, you feel like you, you've tapped everything you can out of it. But it's a skill and in itself to reignite the, the, the and, passion for this, this and, bit. And that's what stage did. That's okay. what stage did. And that, that's what I'm saying. My brain constantly evolves. I think that what I just said to you was true, but now I'm starting, from what you're saying, I'm starting to believe it's complete nonsense. It's <laughs> obstacles, it's things we no, manifest in. layer. It, it, yeah, and, and now, now I know for a fact, because I used to think, oh, if I just do this, for for one uh, for one moment and it has an impact i felt it i used to always remember it it's becoming far and few now uh, the best way to describe it because i had to cry a lot in that and and i had to get to an, an emotional state and it wasn't always easy and it's almost like you know certain passages of the text or certain words that come into your head and you go i said it like this i felt it like this i'm letting go of that now because i was getting too precious over previous performances and the truth is like it's got to be fleeting and it's weird because certain passages of that, I cried at the exact same moments and it felt a little bit different each time. Sometimes it felt a little bit similar, but I tried to not think about that. And I tried not to think about past performances and I tried to stay present in the moment. And that, that helped massively. And, and like I said, just letting it be, letting it be and just breathing it out. And now that's the, that's the thing I'm trying to, I used to watch my performances a lot to learn stuff from them, but I'm, I'm watching them less and I'm trying not to fixate on what I've done. I, I know what the feeling was and um, that, those were breakthrough moments for me on stage because I'm learning. I love crying on cue. It is an art form. It is an absolute art form. And I'm really starting to understand the levels to it. Because when we first met, whenever I cried, it would be through rage. It would just be pure yeah. rage pure rage and then so, and then I had a, a breakthrough moment um, Lonesome Workshop with Niall and Lonesome Workshop's a little um, workshop on Bond Street it's great it's pop up he, he does it everywhere but yeah he just unlocked something I had to do a scene and I was on my knees I was on my hand and knees and I was begging I was begging for forgiveness from my girlfriend and um, I was just crying I was just crying and I was like this is new this feels interesting I was like I know I've cried like this in real life but I feel like most male actors, when I see them on screen now, I watch it a lot of the time, I go, you're, you're, you're leaning on the anger. And when I was up on stage that time, it felt so good because 
I, I was I was pleading again. It's this whole like I think you, crying through pleading because I feel like a lot of it is frustration. It's it, crying is a lot of it is linked to frustration and mo what do most blokes do when they get frustrated? We just get pissed off, isn't it? We don't lean to it. We don't want to show the other emotions in that, and that's what I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to tap into that. So if I get to tears through anger, I feel like I've cheated, and <laughs> I got, got to do, I got to do it in a new way. And that's why, that's why that. Yeah, it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on what, what, what actually like the character is going through. Because yeah. sometimes it's truthful. It's true. It's ang truth angry. of the moment. Like sometimes, yeah. why? Like I thought about like why do we cry sometimes? Well, at least men. Or me, and, uh, I I notice that I really rarely cry. In real life, I do cry when I'm watching some cheesy stuff on TV or whatever, or something on the internet. I can cry from music, but I like crying. Just crying, it's it's very rare. Rarely happens to me. Like just you know, because of something happens to me. Like I'm more cry for, for, for people. Like if something happens to other people, but it's easier for me. But, but that's, like when we, I think it's like first. The reaction for us very often is anger, yeah, because like that's kind of like fire, fight or flight. Yeah, right? I don't want to feel sad. Yeah. Fuck feeling sad. Yeah. I did it earlier. I was, I was crying my eyes out this morning, man. Yeah. I was crying my eyes out this morning, and then it's quickly dissipated into rage. Yeah, because that got me out of it. I was like, I'd rather feel pissed off and angry than mm -hmm. fucking cry my eyes out. So, but it, I think it's also one of the sources of like just even anger as well is when you, you know when you feel powerless that's one of the things that basically gets you because like i know i can't do nothing with the, whatever situation is yeah no it's, it's been interesting doing doing that on stage now and mm. i'm finally in a more comfortable place doing that it doesn't feel like too much work and it's yeah. like it's about trusting uh, in all honesty i think the truth is it's all in the text it's all in the text and that's why I could do what I did when you saw it because it's just in the words. Yeah. It's in the words and, and the words do enough and they triggered me on such an emotional level. They, it was just beautiful writing, man. It, it honestly is. And um, Matt's done the same thing. We're about to do this Western and now the new thing that I want to do is an accent uh, and do it mm. really well though. Like, yeah. because, and, and that's what he said because I've got to do this really emotional scene where I like basically execute somebody in a saloon and it's and it's very i've got to say a very deep and visceral thing and i've sent matt some clips of it and he's well yeah. happy with it i'm well happy with it as well and i'm fucking excited to get yeah. out of there when i came in to do it in front of um the workshop mate i don't know what happened to my voice box it just seized up well if you're nervous it just basically gets so constrained all, like straight away but this is this is what fucked me up and this is the, the thing that happened when i walked in there if they just let me perform the text the way i prepped it yeah it would have been fine but that, I, I, when i went up there they said oh so you're gonna do an accent i was like yeah and they went okay just tell us about the character but in the accent and i that's when it went because i wasn't ready for that i was like oh fuck and that's why i love working with matt because matt's yeah. a crazy bastard and he used to go into work he used to put on the accents and that. He convinced Australians he was Australian. He's got a very good control over his voice. Yeah. And it's, it's so awe-inspiring. And I love watching him work. Mm -hmm. And I just watched him play a Scottish man. And uh, it was just brilliant, man. It was yeah. just, yeah. So what's the project you're, you're doing, like you're preparing for? The, the Western? The Western. It's called Blood Debt. So basically, Matt works in immersive um, bar experiences. Yeah. And uh, one of the immersive bar experiences is a saloon. And they were looking at it and goes, we can shoot in this location for free because we work here. We can use all the costumes. It's like, it would be dumb not to shoot a little Western yeah. clip. But, like, but he, this is a proof of concept. Yeah. And we're going to do other stuff. We're going to do some shots on horses, um, like campfires and, and shit like that. And yeah, it's a, it's, just a, it's, a deep, it's a deep story, man. Like he's, um, and I know why he selected me for it, for this, this role. And uh, yeah, it starts out like we we've been taken in by an Indian tribe. I'm, I'm in love with one of the women and I have a, I have a kid with them. Yeah. And then a, a platoon comes in and just murders the whole lot of them yeah. whilst we're uh, out hunting. And then I uh, come back to my dead family, isn't it? and that's gonna, be, that's gonna be intense when we finally get around to shooting that. But this is the crescendo. We're shooting the crescendo. Like I've, it's called Blood Deck because I've got a list. I've got a list of all mm. the soldiers and I'm gonna slowly slaughter every single one of them mm. in a path of revenge. The bond's there, the chemistry's there for me and Matt. Like, 
I always knew we were going to play brothers at some point. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that we're finally playing brothers because we will make it very convincing. Cause yeah, we, yeah well, you, you definitely did. I still remember uh, that amazing performance that you both did in class with like when you both were crying. That was the the epiphany. That was the the switch. And even Lee saw it in me that day and everybody did. And I was like, shit, like yeah. that. But that's when I started tapping into that darkness too much because I was like, this is my truth. My mm -hmm. life is dark. You, you lot are seeing it because mm -hmm. there's a line in that. There's, like, there's a line in that and I still think about that line today. And it's like, how do you know? How do you know? Because I don't even fucking know. If I don't know, how the fuck do you know? Mm -hmm. And that there was something in that. And that's what I'm talking about. It's in the text that those words just resonated with me so hard and that just lit something up in me man and ever mm. ever since then I that's when I knew and I was like that and that, that was when the truth finally started to pierce through into my work and that's what I've got to f keep tapping into now mm. and and I've had many breakthrough moments like that in class because I was almost going to quit because I couldn't find this lightness and then the day I wanted to quit I was so light man and I had the whole class laughing and it, it just yeah there's got to be truth in it that's all that's all yeah. i know that's all i know but that that was a breakthrough day for me and matt because matt's he said that was the first time he ever cried on camera mm -hmm. and and now we've been teaching each other to do that and we thought like i said we thought we knew how to do it we've done myers now there's so many ways to get there there's so many ways to get there but it's that it's we talked about it a lot it's not the be all and end all and i finally realized that i was like, oh yeah i'm good at that but it don't mean shit if i can't make anybody laugh That's it. So it depends on your niche, but it depends uh, on the niche. But I think an actor needs to have range. A true, yeah. like a true actor, the, the the greatest actors that I've ever seen, they need to embody something else, bring truth to it. But they need to have a range, hmm. and that's what that's what I see, and that's why I like um, I've. I, I, I'm not. I'm not talking down about a lot of male actors, but it's like I'm saying. I'm. I'm. I'm tired of the frustration. I'm tired of the frustration leading to crime, anger, and all that. I'm like, I want to see something new. I want to see new levels to, like men. Men are allowed to be vulnerable. Like we're allowed to be vulnerable, yeah. especially in this day and age. It's, it's coming more and more prominent, and that's why I stand, like tall and proud about my mental health and stuff because. I'm not, I don't want to trauma dump on people. I don't want to, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable, but I can't help my reality and what I've lived. Yeah, of course. And, and, my, and my dad's a testament to that. He feels awkward as well. Like, and we, we, we walk around with this awkwardness sometimes because we don't want to make other people uncomfortable. But the truth of the matter is like our lives have been very uncomfortable and that's our reality. So what, what am I supposed to do with that? Mm. I, don't, I don't know. And that's, that's all I've known. But now I've got to work on My, my inner peace, my joy, and that's what's going to help elevate my work even more because it can't, you can't live in the darkness forever. And no matter what happens, you, you've got to keep moving forward. Like, you've got to keep moving forward. Yeah. Have you thought about therapy? I've been through therapy. Yeah. I've just yeah. been in therapy for half a year. I'm on a little break. I'm, I'm about to go back. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it has helped a great deal. Yeah. It's, it's helped me realize a lot about myself and I'm I'm at a very crucial point in my life where I've got to work on my self security, and um, that acting's the main glue that holds it together. But I'm struggling in a lot of aspects of life right now, like my relationships. Um, yeah, I'm just not. I, I really need to work on myself. I, I'm. I, this goes back to the laws of attraction. You've got to be right in yourself in order to attract the right things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not right yet. I know I'm not. And that's what the therapist has addressed. That's what I've addressed. And I need to get my head right, and I'm doing it slowly because it's it's a process. But it's um, yeah, man, it's the anger. Like I got I got serious anger issues, and I've really got to work on them. And I'm getting how? Better. What what are the tools that you have to work on that? Just calm, just calm myself. Just be more rational. Um, it didn't help for a period of time because I was on steroids and that, that that just doesn't help and I saw a really good thing with Dr. Israel recently he's like he's he's big in the game of doing that he's big on juice as well mm -hmm. um, and that he opened my eyes it's like a fog it's like a you, you do think about violence a lot of the time and I was already an angry individual and um, I, yeah I, I think I think I've seen the, the video I think it was him when he was saying like the basically yeah when you're on steroids you're based you're you are like first of all you're getting dumber you're, you're yeah yeah you, you you like I'm not I'm not an idiot like I've got a, a, a certain level of intelligence but it does create fog yeah, yeah, yeah it does create fog and it's harder to rationalize because testosterone I, I, honestly I think that it's this 
the people that won us wars in the past, they were hopped up on testosterone, mm. but I think they had it naturally. And this is why you got brutes and you got like you got brains and you got brawn. And the people who have got brawn have got a lot of natural testosterone and they're ready, they're ready. And I, I didn't, I didn't have it. And then I artificially put it in my body and I was already an angry person. And it did, it did things to me. Like, I don't think this is the thing, man. I think it's, steroids can be good. They can be good in certain cases. And especially a lot of the older generation, they're finding it. A lot of people are getting onto this TRT therapy and that this, this hormone replacement. And I've met some pe guys that have been getting it done older and it's done them wonders. They feel better because their libido's going down there. It's for people that actually need a boost in testosterone. Yeah. But I think I did need it, because like, like Matt, I'm a weird I'm a weird guy, man, because me and him, like, I'm still going through puberty. I'm I'm 32, nearly. Like, I, I didn't get I didn't get facial hair until I was about 23 and stuff. I didn't get armpit hair until I was about 18. Hmm. And me and him have got young, youthful looks and stuff. And I feel like a part of that was a lack of testosterone. I don't hmm. know. Because I noticed every time I did a course, I started getting more beard hair and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I think I was miss I, I was missing testosterone. Man. That's it's, it's, yeah, it's different for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but now I'm at a point now where I'm like, I've seen its negative effects, I've seen its positive effects, and I just don't need it right now. I was doing it mainly for that character, that Maverick, the, mm -hmm. the one we shot out in um, Italy, because I was like, he's a stripper. I just want it to be in good shape all the time. And uh, mate, I, I, this is something that needs to get talked about and addressed more in the industry. It's like half of the actors you see that are no mate they're on steroids mate. no of course they are on steroids and it's so annoying when they try and downplay it and the studios try and downplay it. it's like i'm not a fucking idiot i work out doesn't matter like they're not athletes they don't compete they don't break yeah. any rules like if you need to look like this for the character and you do it in a smart way you're not harming yourself you have like people who actually teach you how yeah. to do it without harming yourself i don't care why why play it like it's all no no it's, it's, it's about the kids isn't it it's about the kids and not and not get influence them in the wrong way. Cause like I said, steroids can be awful, mate. They can be yeah, so course. bad. And if you're not educated on them, you can really fuck your body up and you can really do bad shit. And yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's it. That's it. How, that's like, it. How, how did you do it? Like when you did steroids, how did you do it? How you, how did you control? Like, did you study what to take? I've just grown up around it. I'm a fucking lunatic. Cause the first ever steroid I touched was Trend. And Trend's crazy. Like yeah. Trend is the, that is the war drug. Like it, it was, I think if we if we want to send soldiers to war, just get them hopped up on trend, mate. They want to fuck. I, I barely slept, mate. I'd sleep like five hours and I'd wake up and I was like, oh, I just want to do some press ups. <laughs> I'd just be on one all the time, man. I was on one all the time, and it was just it's it's an interesting thing. But I'm, I'm I've always been curious about substances and things like that because every time I've done them, it's unlocked something in me mentally. But I think that's part of the reason I've been addicted to a lot of things. But now I've there's only a certain amount you can get out of most things. Like I, I had that with weed, and it with ketamine. So yeah, but I'd, but I'd say that three three drugs that have definitely changed my life is um yeah THC, ketamine, and and steroids, but mm. also psychedelics, man. But I I have abused all of those. Mm. I've abused all of those things, and through the abuse, I've realised yeah, there's there's. There's only so much positive you can get out of it, but I, I didn't actually abuse steroids. To be fair, man, mm. I didn't do them that hard, like at all. Mm. And I did them cleverly. Uh, my cycles. Most guys will do about. Some of them will do can, can do up to three to four cycles in a year, depending on how long the cycles are. Um, and I was doing two max. And uh, now, now it's nearly been a year away from it, and I feel better. But I know there's still some of it in my system and stuff like that. It takes a while. Why but, were you doing it like in the, in the first place? Curiosity, man. I was, uh, yeah, just curiosity. Because I, I don't think you ever had like a goal, like I just want to be very, very big and strong. And yeah, huge and, you know. I just wanted to be strong, man. And yeah. I, I'm still working on my strength. I'm still you're, working. You're huge. I, I've seen you working out. Like I've seen your stories, like how you work out because it's fucking intense. I wouldn't be able to do it. It just looks scary to me and very, very kind of dangerous because you do some some of some exercise. I feel like fuck. There's like it's one step to the injury. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. But I, that's what the, I love the fear. I love being on the edge. That's what pushes me. Yeah. I like being scared. I don't normally have a spot. People don't normally spot me because mm. I, I, the fear of failure pushes me through. Like, <laughs> and and that's the thing. But that's all all I learned through through the steroids is like I'm an animal, mate. Like I'm an absolute animal, and I don't need them. Mm. Like I know I'm, I know I've got the capacity to do that, and I actually normally hit my PRs off cycle. That's all I noticed. That when I initially did them, it helped me a lot with my strength, 
And then after a point, I actually realized every time I finished a cycle, I was actually doing my best work off a cycle because I was getting so paranoid about not being on them. I was like, oh shit, I need to overcompensate for this. And I actually, I was lazier when I was on the steroids. Mm. I, was, I actually work out so much harder when I'm not on them and, and I'm vicious, mate. And, and, and I keep, um, it's all about goals. It's like it, it, within anything we do, and that's the only reason I like working out. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me, I've got to have a new goal. Uh, right now, I'm just trying to overhead press 40 kg dumbbells. I'm on 38s now. I'm there. I'm nearly, I'm nearly there. And it, but it's, that's been months of work, man. I haven't posted about it because that's what I've been working on. And in, in a month or two, people are going to see me lifting them weights. But, bruv, it took a lot of work to get there. It I took, don't think I ever, took, uh, ever yeah. went, like, got past 20s 20 but that's what i started on like that was a, i'd say about f four months ago i was struggling with the 20s every time i go in there i'm like i remember i, I do strength training i mainly do five reps we're getting off acting man <laughs> but i do like five, five that's what i'm normally going for i'm going for five tidy reps yeah and uh, that's strength people think you need like yeah it's five then you work your way to eight if you can do eight and 12, up that fucking weight, man, because yeah. you, you can up that weight. Hmm. And it's the same, but I, 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 love, I love that principle because I apply it to everything. Hmm. It, bleeds into, it bleeds into my life now. Like I, I look at things, I'm like, okay, that can be improved. Everything can be improved. Like, and, and that's the way I do it. It's like start off small, stretch it out. And yeah, but you have concentrated like on one kind of part of your life first and then go, because if you try to improve everything at once, I think it like- I, I work out once a week at yeah. the moment. I work yeah. out and that, but I, I couldn't have done that back then because I had to build up the, uh, the mass, the foundation, the strength. But now, I, at the moment, when my legs are shrinking a bit, I'm going to start training them a bit more. But it ain't about the size, it's about the strength, it's yeah. about the power. And I work out once a week, but it's intense. And I know when I go in there, it's a, it's a very intense thing and I've really got to step up because that's what I tell myself. It's like, I'm not working out every day of the week now. You're working out once a week and you've got to fucking smash the back doors off mm. of it when you do it. And that's, that's what I try and do. And it, I love that, le that approach and that level of discipline because I try and bleed that into my acting work. Same, that same level of determination and discipline mm. is, is important. And the only reason that I, that I wanted to get a bit bigger was because I want to get casted for certain roles, man. I'd love to play Bane or something like that or some, some badass thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, one day, one day I'll play an absolute mammoth because I think it's so fascinating when you see like really big, scary blokes that can do vulnerable shit. Hmm. That yeah, it's true. It's true. But like, it's, it's it doesn't happen a lot on screen because if you're a big scary dude, usually no one expects you to to have you know yeah. some vulnerability. <laughs> well, who's the guy that's playing in Reach? Or what's that guy called? And he he did that film with Henry Cavill recently. Yeah, I think he's got it. Dave yeah. Batista's got it. Like yeah. they. He, but I think. He, uh, but I just recently I read uh, that Batista stopped training recently like he doesn't train as much because he decided he needs to lose a lot of body weight and just the muscles just because to uh, a certain roles were close for him he decided to become smaller to go get into more dramatic roles yeah so yeah. And that's what i mean i feel like batista a real, he's a real actor man like i yeah. can see it good. Yeah. i can see it and yeah. I'm, I'm excited to see the rest of his career yeah um yeah, and I, that's what I want to see. I want to see more of that, man. Like these mm. these big scary dudes, just like that can that have a range. Yeah, that mm. isn't just them. And like I don't, I've written a script, and um, uh, I'm waiting for that to get produced down the line. And I'll probably I'm gonna have to emaciate myself. I'm ready to do stuff like I'm ready for mad body transformations. That's the, one of the main reasons I wanted to try and get myself as big as I could at one point because I was double the size of this at one point I was a fucking lump mate and uh, but I had to do that because it's muscle memory yeah and now I know because you need to create that muscle memory so if I ever do strip down and emaciate myself I can just bring it back yeah I much easier than, than if you and do it from scratch and yeah. I'm not gonna lie sure. I'll probably use steroids when I do that like uh, it's, it's uh, and that's and that's what another thing they don't tell you these people that do these things I guarantee mate I, I just got this i got this hunch christian bale did that man 100 no way because I, I see it and i'm like nah man that, that, that size difference i don't care how he did it <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. but that's what i don't look into it too. that's the thing but some people are really on it and some people are very anti that and that's why i'm, I'm here to break down the stigmas of a lot of things man that's yeah. what one of my purposes in life is to yeah d destroy stigmas because Stereotypes do they exist for a reason, mate. I'm not gonna lie. There's of certain course. people that repeat behaviors now, but it's not always the case. Yeah. It's not always the case. And um, yeah, some some people are exceptions a, a lot of the time. And it, I think we need to address that more. Um, 
Yeah. Let, let's let's talk about yeah. all of the projects that you want to talk about. I think Killing Andy Turk, uh, the new thing with There Might Be Monsters. I've done a, a selection of shorts that I really fight with. I've done music videos that are really cool and stuff. And um, yeah, uh, there's just a few that have really stood out to me. But yeah, The Turk is definitely one of them. Um, I've got quite a good pounds with James now, the guy that, uh, that wrote it and um, he's actually in it as well. And he's he's just made a really cool series called Fire at Will, which is, oh, you'd fucking love it. That's doing well, it's starting to win some awards. But um, yeah, The Turk was great, man, because that's when um, me and Matt just did some, uh, this is me, man. Like this is one of the things I want to try and do in the industry is like, I do want to start breaking some industry standards because they get a bit rigid and boring. And it's like, why, like everybody's like, oh, 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 I can't do it like this. And it's like, oh, just like, just chill out. Like just chill out a little bit. And when I self tape for the Turk, I just see there was two names on it. I saw there was two names on it. And I was like, this other role's perfect for Matt. I, was, I messaged him, I was like, brother, we need to self tape for this. And I was, um, I was miles away from him. I was I was living in Kent somewhere, and uh, I, I said to him, I was like, I'm gonna drive up and see you. He's like, Can you help me with this self tape? He went, Sure, yeah, yeah, okay, let's do it. We sat in the car. Like I said, Matt's the bollocks. I'd already prepped the text a bit. Matt's the bollocks. He learns it on the spot. <laughs> learns it on the spot. We're sitting there and we're just pretending we're in the car and we send it off. And I was like, and he goes, That was quite unorthodox what we did. And I was like, Yeah, I believe in unorthodoxy because I like I think it's more exciting. Yeah. But it shot me in the foot. It shot me in the foot, and now I'm starting to see. The, like, the lines of it. If, like, if it's a bit more innocent, like I said, if it's not making people too uncomfortable, that was fine. In that scenario, it was fine. The director saw it, James saw it, and they were just like, they rang us up two weeks later. It's like, both of you. And I said, told Matt, and he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I told you. That's why I did that, man. <laughs> like, that's why I did that. And then it's just led to some great things because now we've met Velton and um, yeah, we're just doing some cool projects. And that, that project led to They Might Be Monsters. Mm -hmm. And now me and Velton and Jane, Jane's going to play my mum soon. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a very dramatic yeah. piece, and I'm looking forward to that. So yeah. the Turk led on to good things. Got me signed to Fiona as well, because yeah. Matt, <laughs> Matt went to go put it on his showreel, and then she went, who's that? <laughs> oh, really? She, <laughs> and she has it? And that's it. And I went in, I, there was no it, there was no discussion, really. Uh -huh. But she, she wanted like, to- You're with us. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's good, because like right now, it's four of us, four of us, for working at just studios, four of us with, with Fiona Cross, with my agent. Yeah, no, nah, Turk, Turk's been good to us. It's been very good to us. and it's um, So what's happening with it? Like, is it finished? It's a shame because like we talked about it with James, like his new thing, Fire at Will, fucking it's brilliant, mate. It's so brilliant. I love it. I love it. And I, I do like the turp, but it's just not shown. I don't think it's good enough for the pitch. I don't think it's good enough for the pitch because it shows the characters and that. But his ideas for that series are fucking wild, mate. And he should have been planted more of that mm -hmm. in the pilot. Because there, there's going to be a serial killer on the loose. You don't know who who it was going to be. It was going to be one of us. It could have been me. And like, mm. I don't, and he wouldn't have told us until further on in developing the series. <laughs> and the characters that he had ready to go was just brilliant. Like Jane was going to play um, uh, Matt's girlfriend's mum. She's going to try it on with him at the dinner table and all sorts. Like, and I was like, the dinner table scene is the scene, mate. That's what will get people in because they'll be like, why are they all behaving like this? They're fucking lunatics and that. And yeah. <laughs> so it, was it like a, like a proof of concept? Yeah, but he's, he's not giving up on it, man. And I'm so glad because he said that um, we, we should go out and film some stuff. And I was like, yes, mate. Right. So now we just got to make it ju That's all I've learned with uh, pilots and stuff. It's got to be juicy, mate. And we've learned that with Healing Andy because the first two edits didn't work. And, and we were all so baffled because we were just like, what's not right about it? And then Freddie and Lorenzo got their heads locked together and they just completely switched the dynamic of it and it just looks crazy now. Uh, just in editing room? Uh, yeah, because basically it was four episodes. Uh, so and, if uh, you uh, remember, if you haven't watched, go and watch the episode with, uh, with Freddie. Frederick Lysgaard, uh, and uh, The Healing Andy is a series that the, you guys shot in turn, like in, in the course of what, a year, two years? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's still it's dragging out, still, it's still going on, man. And, we, and we still probably got some more content to film yeah. in order to promote it. Yeah. Because the promotion is going to be fucking crazy. People are not ready. We're about to do some fucking wild shit <laughs> that is going to probably get us some recognition. But, but that, that's what this whole project has been about. And that's what I'm about as an actor. That's what gets my juices flow is, is, is conceptually different ideas. Yeah. And this con concept is out there, mate. It's different, mm -hmm. never been done before. And it's going to be fucking crazy. And that, the whole process has been mad. The new pilot. 
is the bollocks, mate. It's the, it grips you. It grips you hard. It didn't before. The previous episode, we were like, it's good, but we're too attached to it. We understood the characters, and all he did was got episode one and two and just crashed them together. Yeah. And, and then the same with three and four, and we're like, oh my God, this is better. And it, it's all about condensing. It's all about cutting out dead space. Yeah. Anything that isn't expositional, doesn't serve the piece especially within comedy, sometimes it's hard because you go off on a tangent and you want to do this. And that's why this project's been crazy because originally it was a feature film. Yeah. But we recorded way too much footage. And then uh, Lorenzo sat there and goes, nah, man, this has got to be a series now. And, now it, and then we had to go out and shoot more stuff. So originally we thought we'd wrapped it in the first shoot. Yeah. When the shot, the second shoot, it, it become half the time that it took each time. So the first time was about two weeks. The next time was about a week. And the other, the last time we shot was about five days ish. Um, and but long hours, like 14 hour shoot days, fuck all sleep, like just, just driven by passion. That's all it was just driven, driven by that. And just been like, we've got to do a fucking yeah, good yeah. job. But there was so much development that went into that. Like, uh, that Freddie didn't really touch on it. Like Lorenzo is a fucking mad man. Like he is crazy, mate. Cause we, we shoot all that footage. He's watching through, I can't remember how many hours of footage we shot, mate, but he, he's watching through all of it. He's, he's filtering through all of that, finding the things that it's been through three edits. Mm. And, and, and the thing that people don't, uh, won't realize is that when we actually developed it, he, like um, Freddie said, there was a rough, there was a loose script and that. We helped develop that by coming in and he goes, these are your characters. This yeah. is what's going to happen in the exhibition of the story. And he'd record us for about five, five to seven hours in rehearsals. He'd watch back that footage. And then he'd um, dissect bits out of it, and f that's how he formulated the script. Yeah. We get to Italy, the script goes out the fucking window. <laughs> I I can, you can't make it up, mate. And it is, but it, it, that's what because we, we didn't really understand the dynamic of shooting because uh, Freddie touched on it, and Lorenzo would just be in our ears off camera, just going, "Oh, that's fucking brilliant! You gotta do this, do this," <laughs> and and, and we would just be like, "Oh shit, yeah, that is." And and the sh whole shooting started. That's what I don't think people are ready for the way we shoot and the way we've done this. I don't think it's ever been done that way before either. Mm. Maybe with TikTokers and shit like that. I don't know, but it's it's yeah, it was it was wild. It was fucking. It was a wild thing. But you like you can't shoot everything like that. It's just like it's very very specific project could be could be done like this. Yeah. Some things should be written like just word to word. Every kind the of monologues. The monologues stayed the same ish. Yeah. Like that's that's all I knew. It's like when <laughs> Lorenzo, he, he, he probably won't watch this anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, but it, the, there was an ongoing joke because I stopped learning the script, mate. I stopped learning. I learned my monologues, and then they would be like, I wouldn't even know what scenes we were shooting by the last shoot. And I'll just be there, and I'll be in character, and I'll be like, all right, and I'll just be tapping Matt on the shoulder and be like, yeah, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd be like, don't let Lorenzo hear you. And I was like, I know my monologues, mate, fuck off. <laughs> I know the important bit. And because uh, it didn't matter, all the other stuff, but it held with blocking a little bit. But even that'll go out of the window because yeah. we, we'd be like, okay, originally it was meant to be set in this location, but we're in this location now. So it completely changes the whole yeah. dynamic of the scene. And we shot so much at like, yeah, it's crazy, man. I, I remember Freddie said you were swimming in some kind of pond in the park trying to get the I didn't swan want, or whatever. Yeah, I didn't want to get arrested because I was like, oh, I could get done for animal cruelty or something. And I was like, and as I got closer, no, the swan did want to attack me. Like, yeah, yeah. I could see it. it was like, and I've heard swans, they're, they're lethal, mate. And I was shitting myself <laughs> a little bit. I was like, well, what if you like jab my eye? I might float in the water there. there this big angry swan here. And I was like, uh, and it had its, and it had its babies around him. So it was obviously yeah, in protective yeah, mode. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I really didn't think this through. And I was like, now I just look stupid on camera. And now all the locals are staring. I'm, on, I'm in a fucking pink thong. I'm in a pink thong. And all, all the fucking locals are just looking at me like, this fucking reprobate. Like, what is he doing in our fucking country? Brits. <laughs> fucking Brits abroad, man. I'm acting. I'm not really like that. <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. No, it was wild, mate. Uh, yeah. Like Freddie said, we got, yeah, we got stopped by police a couple of times. And um, yeah, we just out there and, and, and local restaurants like call it like going we're gonna call the police mm. what are you lot doing because we're just acting like fucking lunatics in public i loved it i loved it i wouldn't change it for the world it was like freddie said it it i think it made us like that stage show recently that's helped make me in, as an actor a bit but healing andy man was like that was the breakthrough for all of us that's what told us like because none of us have really been on major major stuff but it made us feel special for a change. Yeah. It made us feel like, no, I don't even know about important, but powerful. It made us r realize what our strengths were 
and that's what Freddie said. We all grew as actors together. Like mm. they made me realize my strengths. They made me realize my weak points and vice versa. And then we, and we just, it was just all about building each other up. It was all about building the egos had to leave. Um, I had one, like one diva moment because I thought something should have been a specific way, but it, it's all been learning curves, man. Like it's all been learning curves and uh, yeah, it's been a beautiful process. Mm. I, lo I, I love healing and it's going to stay with my heart forever. And I've, I've got a genuinely got a feeling like it's going to, there's probably going to be a sequel and a prequel. Um, cause the, yeah, the producers are looking at it now and they, yeah. they love it. And I'm just waiting and all the boys, we're, we're a bit. I'm a bit anxious now because yeah. like the thing that I've been fighting and striving for for so many years seems like it's finally potentially manifesting and we don't know how it's going to manifest or what it's going to turn into but all I know is that we, we I think we're finally going to get recognition for some of that our skill and our talent I don't know if it's because I feel like it could be a little cult following thing like mm -hmm. this little cult group of people because I grew up watching things like the mighty boosh I don't know if you have you ever no. heard of the mighty boosh that's what I mean but a lot of English people would know what the mighty boosh is people just do nothing have you heard of that yeah. again but it's got a big following well, you should, you should remember got, you should remember out from other yeah, countries so. yeah, but yeah, it's, so. it, they've been pretty prominent like especially people just do nothing you will probably recognize, recognize MC Grinder. they're a group of lads that made a mockumentary taking the piss out of garage music <laughs> but they're actually good at garage music <laughs> and now they're doing live shows but it's in these characters and it's fucking brilliant yeah. I love it I, I absolutely love it it's genius and we're always sunny in Philadelphia man what the fuck people slept I slept on that yeah. I can't believe I slept on that and now it's my favourite fucking show right? I, I, I was and, the same I, yeah. I discovered well, like on, on the season what season is right now I don't know they're Fourth? on uh, basically I discovered like two years ago yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah. So because it came out on Netflix all of a sudden I was like Oh, that, that, yeah. what's this and I was like this looks kind of old and apparently yeah. it used to be on channel 5 in this, yeah. uh, like, in this country yeah. and, that. and I was like never seen it never seen it slept on it Hayley and Andy could be that no. Just the thing that we release, a lot of people cutting onto it and go, oh, that was fucking class. And then people might pick it up later. It's like, um, what was the one that blew my mind? Taboo with Tom Hardy. Yeah. I fucking love that show, mate. Like, yeah. I, I can't they promised another season. Yeah. Never, never, never released it. No, yet. but I'm, I'm sort of glad we're ending. It's the same as Mindhunter. That's one of my favourites. But the, 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 Taboo in particular just wound me up because I was like, that was a great fucking show. I saw it when it came out and then people were acting like they just discovered it. Just like they discovered Willem Dafoe all of a sudden, <laughs> like after the new Spider-Man. I was like, no mate, these people have been here for a very <laughs> fucking long time. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, yeah. It just, a shit like that just makes me laugh and Healing Andy could become that. Yeah. But then yeah. we got other things coming out and like this might be monsters thing. Tell me about that. <sighs> what's, the, what's the concept? We're shit monsters at, at, at like an AA meeting. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm Frankenstein's monster. Um, I've got part French man brain, part German. <laughs> I'm myself and I'm Susan. And Susan was the trickiest character to play. Yeah. Because I had to be like a middle-aged, just like yeah. proper woman. Yeah. And I had to jump in and out of these characters. It was just a fun process. Yeah. But Matt's, Matt's character was one of my favourite characters because he's the invisible man, but he's just bollock naked. <laughs> and we all have to convolute in the fact that he is invisible because it will hurt his feelings. <laughs> And it's just so fucking funny. And we're all tipped out. And it, and it was so weird because my character's like, he's he's rough council estate sort of guy. And I just, the whole time I was like, I wouldn't tolerate this. If, if I was from where I'm from, I was like, I would not tolerate this guy being bullet naked, waving his junk about in my face and stuff. Like the things he was doing, man. <laughs> but all the, all the characters are great. We had like a shit vampire, like, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, like Carrie, you know, the Stephen King one. But like she, she could just wobble things. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and, and, and that. And there's, and there's so many nods to classic like monster films nice. and it's written by Velton and Jack as well and Jack's a fucking lunatic I love him he's a film reviewer real film buff actor as well just an all round funny dude yeah. man I, I really love him but they wrote that and they've loved it so much we love filming it so much and he goes now it's they might be heroes so we got to figure out shit superhero powers and what we're going to do and I'm, <laughs> I'm toying with the idea of being um like a Professor X type, but instead of um, reading people's minds, I end up just spilling my secrets. I'm like, no, 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 don't tell people, like, or some dumb, dumb shit like that. We're playing around with some ideas. Matt's got some ideas, so we need to figure out a superhero uh, once this is released. Because I think they might. I just know now. I got this. I got this level of intuition when I film a project. Uh, I know when something's going to be good, and uh, they might be monsters. Going to be very good, and uh, I'm so I'm just so curious about 
how well it's going to do because he wants to do that and then i think he wants to do like a trilogy and the last one's like they might be like spies or whatever mm. but okay it's always this concept of like we're just very do, shit at there what might we do. be spies they definitely need a russian spy yeah I oh yeah so. yeah i'll try yeah definitely need a russian spy this, this right? guy right here comedy genius <laughs> <laughs> russian spy who thinks that he, he has very 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 good english he's accent thinking, yeah <laughs> And he's and he's he's always try, trying to be undercover, but people can just see right through it. <laughs> I, like, I like that. That's brilliant. This is what I mean. It's just dumb shit like that. And that, that that's why I had such a good time on that set, man. Yeah. Because it was just stupid. It was just stupid. I love it. Yeah. Comedy's the one, mate. Because I I just love watching people like Will Ferrell. He's one of my favourites now. I seen him. I seen him on Sam Jones. Um, off camera. Yeah. That, that those interviews, and it just gave me a deep insight to the way he works. And I love Corpse in. I love making other people corpse. I love, uh, and that's what he does. Yeah. And now that's how I got to approach comedy. It's like, I don't care if it fucks up the scene. I'm going to make you laugh. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've got to make you laugh. And that's, yeah. yeah. And that's what, that's when you know it's, it's flowing. So comedy is my new love. Like, you know, I, I love doing drama. I'm good at it. But comedy is a different beast. I, it's I think, a completely different beast. I think you beast. just enjoy comedy more. I do. That's the thing. It is. Yeah. It is, but it, it's, it, it was very cathartic doing that on stage the other day. Yeah. And it gave me a good feeling when I got off. All the build up, fucking horrible. <laughs> like, whereas comedy, it's like, it's, it's, ang it's anxious because you're like, oh shit, I got, yeah. got, it's got to be funny. Yeah. That's the anxiety, but it's. That, that, that's, that's a trap. That is like the trap. You, and that'll yeah. block you. That will yeah. block you. You've got to trust. Because you'll try to be funny instead of. But, but it, being <laughs> but this is what Matt and that taught me and healing Andy the first shoot was so fucking difficult for me man yeah. because they're the only way to describe Matt's character in it is he's ridiculous he's the most ridiculous man you've ever seen but he does it well and it is a bit of a character but there's truth in it and it's so nuanced and perfect and then we got and then we got Freddie as well and and Sam like their their comedy is quite it can be quite slapstick and just like a bit, a bit caricature and theatrical, mm -hmm. and that is not me. Mm -hmm. Like I can be in, in certain cases, it, 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 it depends, but that's when they really taught me that I'm a deadpan comic. Like I've got to say things with conviction <laughs> and anybody that knows me on a personal level knows that I say the most ridiculous shit sometimes. <laughs> and I say it with such conviction and truth. And I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> and then people are just like, what? What did he just fucking say? Like, uh, I thought, and and that's what I had to tap into when I was mm. shooting that man, and and that's what I did on the Turk as well. I walked in there and I was like, oh shit, I know what to do now. Like, I know what to do. I've just mm. got to be me, unapologetic, say things, and that's when I started riffing a bit as well. Like, well, my dad ain't a big fan of the opening riff of the Turk because it's, yeah, it's like, do you know Jay from In Between Us? It's like some sort of shit yeah. you'd say. <laughs> yeah, but it's that. But it, it was inventive. It was fun. It was on the spot, and it was deadpan. Mm. And now I'm starting to understand that. So it, I got a lot of, I've got a lot of love for the boys because they had to crack me. It was hard for me on the first shoot. It was very hard, and they could see how much I was struggling mm. because I tried to play into what they were doing. They were like, mm, and I was like, yeah, what do I do? Yeah. Like, I feel like I'm doing nothing. I was yeah. like, I feel like I'm just in the background, just like. Yeah. And then I realized that's one of his traits. That's one of the character's traits is that he is in the background a lot, but he's always doing random shit. Yeah. And the audience are going, what's Maverick doing? <laughs> like, I'll be fucking like shaving my ass or like, I, but I'll be doing it so nonchalantly and just be like, what? Like, this is me, bro. I'm like, fuck off. Do you want to shave it? Like, I, I really, I, really yeah. can, I can't wait to see it. I can't either. Like, because I've seen the first um, two episodes now and it's just yeah. fucking epic, man. Like the first episode is so gripping. It's so gripping and it just makes you want to watch more. And the, and the format of it is just, it blows my mind, man. We've, we've invented a new format. Hmm. We've invented a new format and people will copy it 100%, just like they copied mockumentary formats. Yeah. Yeah. So it is technically a mockumentary as well, but it's, it's one in its own respect and its own light. And that's what art is all about for me. Like, it's got to be conceptually different. It's got to be conceptually different because that's what my teacher taught me all the way back in my GCSEs. He see me playing it safe, doing pretty stuff. It looked nice. And he's like, it's not exciting though, is it? It's like, that's been done. That's what he used to always say to me. And all the class, because I was a good drawer. I was the best drawer in class. I was. And he would always be watching over me. He'd always be trying to spur me on. Yeah. But I'd always want to cater to everybody around me. Yeah. Like, this is what they like, so I'll make that. That's not art, man. That's a product. That's like... It's designed. It has its place. It has its place. It has its place, life, and it's and it's not and it's not shit. But for me, like he he looked at me and he used to say like art is fleeting. He used to always say that to me. It's like art is a fleeting moment, 
and it's captured. And, any, and, that's, and that's what I started to realise looking back at that is like it was very hev heavily orchestrated. And now when I do, I do occasionally create art pieces, it's so much more free. Mm -hmm. I'm not so precious with it. And that, that is what it's about. But he always said to me, art is about breaking boundaries. It is all about breaking boundaries. That's what all of our favourite artists did. Like directors, when you actually think about it, Martin Scorsese is one of my favourites. And he's got his style. He coined that style. That's him. But he had influences. Tarantino coined his style. Wes Anderson. Like yeah. they, they all had their influences, but they did something different. They all tried to go. Mm, no, I'm doing this. Mm. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. But I like the, there's, there's certain uh, like Yorgos Lathamos. Like he's getting bigger and bigger. But when I watched his uh, like earlier works, like The Lobster and that, people just didn't get it. And I'm mm. like, man, this is cool. Like he's doing something different. He's really thinking outside the box. Same with Wes Anderson. The way he gets his actors to behave, I want to be on a Wes Anderson set because I'm like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. what does he say to them? Or does he say anything to them at all? Like, he just gives them a, a, like a loose prep and goes, yeah, you've got to be quirky. Yeah. Like, it's got to be quirky. Yeah, I think about that a lot. And um, that, that's something I've been saying to, to Matt a lot these days is that we're slowly collecting our directors. We're like directors that fuck with us, we fuck them, and we just want to create good work. And it is laws of attraction. I'm, I'm glad that I haven't had a breakthrough in the industry. Mm. I'm actually glad now. And I'm, I'm embracing it for what it is because you find your directors and they find you. And you, we see it in the industry. Certain directors like Christopher Nolan loves working with the same actors. And now like your, your, Yorgos Lathamos loves Emma Stone. That's yeah. it. You, you click, you click. So I feel like me and me and Lorenzo are clicked. Um, me and Belton are clicked. I just worked with this um, guy called uh, Matt Chandler, and I really love his work. And and you fuck with each other. You understand. There's a mutual respect, and it's not forced. And I'm finally seeing it for what it is. And I've tried to force too many things in the past, and it weren't right. It weren't right. And I can see it for what it is now. And I'm just, one day it would be cool if I could get picked up by one of my favorite directors. That would be cool. It would be fucking awesome, mate. Mm. That, that, that would be a dream come true. But I honestly think I'm starting to work with some of the up and coming new mm. shit hot directors. Because the people that I work with, work with concepts. They, and that's what I want, laws of attraction. Whereas if you go into the industry, the concepts are far and few. People are wanting to play it safe. It's all about the money and what they can make like money wise and it's got to be safe and I, I don't agree with that because I want to be an artist and that feels limited and but at the same time we want those breaks because it gives us a bit more recognition a bit more exposure and it makes things a little bit easier but if we if we can get that recognition through an independent project like Healing Andy then fuck it we've done it man we've done mm. it we've done it like Ben Stiller did it like Seth Rogen like all, all these greats man like they just fucking Wedged yeah. their way in. They just got in, and they said, "Fuck you." Doors open now. Like everybody's look at me. Like it's and, that, and that's it. Yeah. And once you're there, that's it. The, the ball's in your court, mate. And that's the problem with. I just feel like a lot of these studios are lacking imagination these days. I see. I see this recently. They want to remake American Psycho. Nah, mate. <laughs> They will talk about Shaun of the Dead, remaking Shaun of the Dead. Are you fucking stupid, mate? Then they talk about remaking Scarface, the ultimate, the original rise and fall gangster film. You want to remake that? Like, nah, man, get some fucking ideas. We're sitting on some great ideas. People like me and you, Matt. Matt's sitting on some great ideas. There's so many amazing actors and writers out there that are just getting slept on. And, like, and everybody's going, oh, where's the new projects? You're not looking at them, mate. Mm. You're making this, churning out this wanky shit all the time because it, sense, it, it suits people's sensibilities. Fuck that, mate. That ain't art. That is not art. And it, it, it boils my blood, mate. Yeah. It boils my blood. But uh, there's, at the same time, that, that hate and that rage ain't going to do nothing for me, man. I've just got to work on my shit. Mm. And then uh, that'll be it. We set the bar. We set the bar and we keep doing it. And then I'll just get to work with those great directors that I want to work with. And I won't be in these soulless productions that I just don't give a shit about. It's a, yeah. Yeah. It sounds good, man. Yeah. Who are your biggest inspirations right now in the acting world? It's always been Viggo Mortensen, man. He's been a big, <sighs> he's been a big inspiration in my life. But I don't know, man. I go through phases. I, I love Denzel. I love Denzel so much. Um, I, I rewatched Training Day the other day. Fuck me, man. I just like some of my favorite actors are the anti heroes. That's all I've realized recently. There's some of my favorite roles I've ever seen, like pa like Patrick Bateman or like um, yeah Denzel Washington in Training Day. There's certain things that just stood out. Viggo's so good at that. Good yeah. at playing the light and the dark. Um, 
I don't know, man. Like Robert Patterson's growing on me a lot. There's so many, man. I don't have a favourite. Mm. I don't really. I, I do lean towards Vigo a lot because he just he's inspired me a lot. Yeah. I just love his style and what he does and just in general, like he, he's because I, I I actually thought about it just a few days ago. I felt like how fucking good is Vigo because he is an amazing actor, but also he's he seems like a, to be like a great nice human being yeah. just like apparently he's very intense though yeah and I, i'm an intense person man i think me and him would get on i don't know <laughs> but then he might not like me <laughs> Who knows? i don't know i don't know yeah that's a weird thing about your peers man like and and your uh the people you idolize mm -hmm. isn't it some of your idols could be absolute bellens <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and true. you're not yeah. not even sure but yeah Vigo, Vigo's the bollocks man he's the truth you can't deny yeah. him and that's all yeah. i look at as actors And that's what um, Joe Rogan said to a lot of his comic pals, and I, I, it just resonates with me so much. It's just be undeniable. It's, It's like, you know, the, there is a lot of um, arguing right now, like, you know, when someone plays some, you know, different ethnicity or like different whatever, and like there's a lot of people who are like really unhappy about it. When Vigo played, Italian guy, no one said shit, shit. because he was just amazing. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, bollocks. no, no questions. Yeah, it's the same as when I see Matt do an accent. Yeah. It, it, it might piss off as a, a Scotsman and that, but it would be like, mate, he's good. Yeah. He convinced one of the guys on set because he goes, you Scottish? And he goes, no, he did his own accent. He goes, fuck me, he's like, my family's Scottish and that. He's like, bruv, that's good. And that's what I mean. And that's that's what, yeah, yeah. and that's what it is. And yeah, Vigo is definitely a testament to that. And I try and not watch that because that's what acting is. It's like turning around. I'm trying to think of um, certain films. It's like um, Robert De Niro playing someone with Parkinson's. Hmm. He had to do that. Like only they couldn't have got somebody in with Parkinson's to do that because it just wouldn't have worked. Because yeah. he had to play two different. He had to play himself and then the, mm -hmm. the character with Parkinson's. So it's like certain levels to this. So I'm like, yeah, get the real authentic people in, but I'm not going to get butt hurt if you get a northerner coming down to play a southerner. I'm like, he's a good actor. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the time, it is the case they're good actors, mm -hmm. and it's got you just got to leave them to it, man. And I, and I don't want to be judged in that respect. I already have been judged in that respect a few times, and it's it's a weird feeling. I'm like. And this whole thing, and uh, Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians, and he does a whole bit on this. He goes, it's called acting. Like, yes. it's, it's fucking what it is. We're pretending to be something else, funnily yeah. enough. Like, but now everybody's getting typecasted in that, yeah, man. Yeah. It's good. I, I get it. I, I understand I get typecasted, but um, I do get typecasted a lot, man. And I'd I'm, love I'm, to be typecasted. I'd and love I'm, to be cast in general, because honestly, it's just it's th this year, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, like in last year as well, like last three, four years were awful. Uh, in this case, it's just like it's I nothing. think. I feel like Eastern Europeans get a short, short straw, isn't it? Like that because it's it's hard, it's hard, and that, like that's why I've got so much respect for Freddie, man. Like mm. and you, you're in a you're in a different country acting in a foreign language. I can't do that yet. I don't. I don't even know if I can. I will, will ever do that. I don't. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a it's a weird one, isn't it? Because mm. you know, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll try and learn a language and perform uh, perform a piece. I don't. From from what I've my experience, like first of all, most of the actors who are not Russian speaking or like I don't know, like not from Eastern European bloc, who try to do say something in Russian in films, I usually can barely understand what you're saying. It's just it's it doesn't work. Uh, the only one I forgot his name, uh, this actor he was playing in Sacrificing a Pawn, I think, and he was playing this Russian. Grandmaster, and apparently he actually learned Russian for this role, and he can speak it now. Uh, and he has like a few conversations in, in the film, and he speaks Russian, and you can hear a very strong accent. You do, you do hear a very strong accent. But he, I can actually understand him. He actually can speak the language. So I'm not sure how how needed this is because most of the time. Uh, you would be still dubbed over in the country that the the, the, the language you're trying to use, like as a you know, as a British. Yeah, and now I've seen this new AI software, and I don't know how to feel about it because I sent it, I sent it through to like Matt and that, and, they, and he was like, no, 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 because he hates anything that takes away jobs from people, and yeah. I'm like, I agree with you on that yeah. on that front, but at the same time, like this new AI dubbing is better than the current dubbing. Yeah. Because they're actually mimicking the lips, everything, and the and the voice. Yeah. yeah, they haven't got another acting. Yeah, but it's taking the words away from the actor. But it's like, but it's bringing more truth to the piece. And that's yes, what I, fuck I with think more. I think and it actually brings more, like more the, of the original. Yeah, the, and, yeah, and it makes it more gripping. But then yeah. that's when it gets a bit weird because then it's like I don't ever want to watch a fully AI generated film. Yeah, like, I, I don't think I do. I don't mind aspects of it being implanted in. Yeah. 
but yeah, it's just, it's a strange it's a strange time we're living in, and that's why I've gone back to the stage and independent stuff more because I'm like. Uh, Mark Ruffalo talked about it. Then Matt was in my ear about it. He goes, well, no, we got to stick to independent. And I was like, yeah, we do. Because it is actually what I believe in. And it, and it keeps the power with, within us. And mm. that's the problem with these big studios, man. They've got too many outside influences and stuff mm. fucking things up. And Yeah, but uh, that's where, where all the money is. That's the thing. Like, it's, it's better to be, to try to be in both worlds. Because one, like being successful in, you know, in the corporate part, in like in the studio part, gives you more opportunities to do something on uh, like independent mm. and bring more people into it and money as well so mm. yeah no 100 percent. but i, I, I do uh, it's, it's it's a weird topic that the whole the, i don't know yeah i don't i don't feel a certain way about um the foreigners doing acting work in england mm. like i don't i don't give a shit about it really uh, and as long as people are talented mm. and doing what they love that's all that's all i care about But at the same time, I don't want to be judged in that respect. And I feel like I have been a few times and it's yeah. weird. And it's like, and there's double standards getting thrown about. So. Yeah, it's true. Now, nowadays, like there is a lot of conversations about, you know, fair, what's fair, what's not. But at the same time, double standards, they're like just, just yeah. <laughs> getting and stronger I, I and stronger. Think it's, just, it's, it's just a, a bunch of insecure and sensitive people getting butt hurt. And that's the <laughs> truth. And I do it as well. I, I, yeah. I'll put my hand up to it. I do. And it's oh, about, it. and, and it's, yeah, and it's about, rationalizing in your mind and going no i'm actually being highly irrational right now mm. and yeah this isn't serving me this isn't serving me mm. and uh, one thing that freddie said in his interview and uh something that i see like comparisons the thief of joy and like the thief of joy like i don't want my joy to be stolen mm. so i don't want to think about other people and what other people are doing so the more i thought about my work and my craft and where i'm heading to things have just gotten better yeah you can com you comparison in a sense is good if you're inspired yeah but don't think oh i've got to be that no because you're you you're, you're you're authentically you and that's that's all you can be so that's all i draw from it now no, it, no, that's no, all no, i draw like from you, comparison you can, you can be a better version of you yeah because i'm you, like i want to be like vigo yeah i'm comparing myself to him i want to be like him but i'm not going to destroy my joy through not being like him mm. i've just got to emulate certain factors because i can only be me yeah and uh, it took me a while to embrace that It really took me a while to embrace that, but now I've embraced that, and I'm un unapologetically me, and mm -hmm. that's all I can be. So, yeah, and that's all we, all, all, all of us can be as actors. Yeah. I feel like that that's what you can be. That's what you should be. Yeah, not just as an actor, man. Huh? Just in yeah. life, yeah. like that's what you should yeah. be, man. Like, that's what I always liked about you. Like when I met you, like you just felt for me as a just like very raw personality that's like very open. To everything like you're you like i've i've seen you like i always i never thought like he's like hiding something he's like a little bit like he tries to be something or or seem something for other people i think you are you were always you yeah yeah and, it's, and it shows me in the foot because i'm too honest and it's like and that's where i'm saying there's this fine line between trauma dumping and stuff and mm -hmm. I'm, like, i'm not trauma dumping i'm literally just saying how yeah. things fucking are man like yeah. and if you don't want to hear it and it makes you uncomfortable what can i do about yeah. it like i said my life's uncomfortable i'm not trying to make you uncomfortable and yeah. a lot of the time i my intentions are pure man and yeah. that's why it laws of attraction the people that i attract into my life most of them have got pure intentions mm -hmm. and that's that's all i've noticed now and, and that's how i know my heart is heading in the right place and i've just got to stay focused on that and i, I, I can only be me i yeah. can only I, i can only be me so i pr appreciate that and that, that's why i'm drawn to people like you as well like i'm i'm, I'm a bit of a bitter cynic And I attract a lot of bit of cynics, <laughs> and I see a little bit of that in you. I see a little bit, of, and but it's weird because like someone like Freddie, like when we were talking about him, his energy is so different to yeah. mine, man. But it's the purity that's what keeps us locked. Mm. There's there's a sense of like uh, good intention going on, and that's all I know. And that's uh, and I know that through working with Matt is we've been up for the same roles. We've like, and it's always been like shake each other's hands and be like, made a best man win sort of thing. Yeah. But like if you get it. I'm gonna be gas for you, oh, yes. like, and that's how I knew, and that's when I knew I was heading, starting to hang around with the right people because I used to hang around with one dude. He would not have been like that. Mm. And he was, and it took me a while to cut cut him off, and I, I just remember that feeling and that jealousy and that shit. And I was like, what the fuck is this, man? Mm. I was like, this ain't, yeah, no, no, this is a red flag. This is yeah. a major red flag. And I met Matt at working at the studio, and we just used to sit outside. We get there early every time, and we just sit out there sort of talking about life. And that's when we realized, like, we. We, we, we're going to be good mates and yeah. <laughs> like we could tell already and mm. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have a friend like that as well. Like he's also Andre. Uh, he's also an actor, but he's more experienced than me. So we very often, like he's a Russian speaking guy. Very often we get like we go for the same roles. Like we audition for the same roles, and every time we're like, "Did you get it?" Like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." So yeah, yeah, good luck. And every time I think like, of course, of course, I would, I would want to be cast. But like, if he gets the role, and if it's not me. It's better him than somebody else. Like, and we always kind of chat about. It, like, and we kind of, yeah. and we always try to help help each other. Yeah, he, no. Because he grew up in Italy. He's from Moldova. He grew up in Italy. He's Russian, not as good as mine. So, like, very often when we get the the sides for self tapes, we have to translate it ourselves. Yeah. So he like he calls me like, can you just help me with this one? Like, and, and just yesterday he also called me like he's like, I have a guy for yeah. your podcast. Like, just try to help out yeah. uh, all the time because it's, it's like it's so much more productive. Some, some actors in certain situations would actually try and sabotage you, which I just think is bizarre. Man. <laughs> I just think it's the <laughs> maddest. It is. It is, and it's, it's weird, but it's like what you say, if I'm up for the same role with somebody, I have, I've had it with my mate Ray as well, we were both busy though, it just clashed, but we were both going up for a sick role as well, yeah. and I was like, we both really want it, I was like, I'll self-tape with you, mate, yeah. and I will do a good job for you, yeah. like, because I want to see you succeed, or me succeed, vice versa, you get, it's, it's, it's the karma, man, yeah. it's like, I'm not, I'm not very that spiritual or religious, but it's like, the energy you put out is what you're going to receive back. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. Yeah. Fucking and and that, that's why it's important. And I think that's that's why I'm drawn to people like you, man. Because like I just know there's we just want to see each other succeed. Yeah. That's all I care about. I just want to see my friends succeed, and I don't care if they get there before me, and I don't care if I don't get there. And yeah. yeah. But the way things are moving right now, it seems like we're all going there together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes, just, sometimes I have my doubts, man. Sometimes I get through like through very long periods of not act, uh, not acting at all, and I'm just, fuck, it's just like, it's so hard to be an actor and not act. Yeah, but, <laughs> I, yeah, but I was gonna quit in January, man. I, yeah. I was fully gonna quit. I was, I was really getting fed up. Um, more, not, not about not making it, about just my position in life, man. It's a struggle being an actor, and like, I've, I've said it so, so much, like, the amount of holidays I've seen my friends go on and like that I used to hang around with or people that have just lost contact with me and think that I don't care about them anymore. And I'm like, I do, I, I like, but maybe that's me being paranoid. And, but sometimes I see it, it's like, cause I'm not there. Cause you're not present out of sight, out of mind, isn't it? Yeah. So, and, and I see them going on all these mad holidays, doing all this sick shit, going fest. I, just, I don't go to festivals anymore. I don't go see live music mm. and that. Everything's geared around acting. Everything's yeah. towards that. All my money, all my resources and stuff, it's all, it goes towards that. It, it all goes towards that. And I'm, I'm getting tired of it, man, because like, I, I need, as an actor, you need to experience things in life. And I experience, that's why I, I, I'm quite good at what I do is because I've been through a lot. I've seen a lot. I've lived a lot of lives. And that's what a lot of people see me. When they mm. meet me, they go, you, you've lived a lot of lives. And I'm like, yeah. And I, but now I feel like I've been stagnant for so long and I don't feel alive, man. And I need to feel alive. And I need, I need to experience those things in order to get further in what I'm doing. So again, it's towards the acting, but I need this, this break. And my, dad, my dad's not well mm. and, and stuff like that. And it's just, that's weighing on me. Like that's weighing on me. And I, and I promised myself I was going to quit. I, I promised myself I was going to quit. And the day that I quit, I, all of a sudden I got feedback for this audition that I did. It was a big audition with um, with Nick Love. He's one of my favourite directors. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was sick because I got his recognition and that. And that's when I finally knew that I was heading in the right direction. But there was a part of me that was like, I'm just getting fed up with this lifestyle, man. It's just weighing me down. And then the moment I was going to back out of it, that's when we got they might be monsters is happening and Matt's like, get to your fucking arse and gear, son, like move yeah. it. And I was like, oh, fuck's sake. Next thing I know, I've got um, Rosie telling me, oh yeah, we're in like Riverside Studios and that and all these call-ins. And that was the weird thing. No, Matt, because I wanted to get out, all of the good work that I've previously done and all the good impressions I've made and, and, and all the connections I've made are coming back. And they, they, they all started hitting me up and I was like, fuck. And it was all the directors that I've, want to work with i've been waiting to work with again and they turn around to me and it's i didn't even say anything to any of them it's just mm. weird how it's come along so i promised myself we're doing a fringe festival in camden next month and then uh, i was going to shoot this blood debt and then i need a break man but sod's law is that something else is going to pop up mm. but it was so weird because i really wanted to quit but it was because that dry everybody went through the dry spell of the strike but us lot was still working because we were doing healing andy and i still did a stage show and stuff yeah so i kept my brain active and that's all i'll say to you brother is if if the, the lack of acting is upsetting you 
then you you got to you got to find something because just go do something acting related and uh, well, it's hard. I'm doing this shit. This. And I was, I was gonna say you're doing <laughs> you're doing this, but it's it's yeah because I've read uh, I've read a couple of your scripts before um, the the series you was writing the sci-fi and that. And um, yeah, I think that's that's something you should maybe delve back into, like mm. more. Is that you you are you are a good writer, and you should explore it some more. And yeah. uh, that's what that's all that me and Matt have been doing, and that's all all um, other people around us have been doing. Is yeah, we just creating projects mm. independent. I've just been voice noting somebody, and she she said the same thing, and she's like. A, 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 pretty much a working actor in the industry and mm -hmm. stuff and she's saying yeah the stuff the indie stuff's better man look what's next for you man the, the, just that I, the, the, I say I, I say I want to I want to break but um, I think me, me, and my, me and my old man just needs to go on a holiday enjoy the time that we got left together and stuff and um, that's that's one of my main intentions at the moment I just want to get I'm, I'm going to smash the back doors out of that Western, like I will do a yeah. sick job, and that's hopefully going to lead to more things. So I'm, ne I'm never going to quit acting. I sat down and had a really intense chat with my dad about it the other night, and I was just like, I'm just at a place, uh, just at this weird impasse, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm professional what I do, but there's still so much work to be done. And yeah, blood debt's going to be a big part of it because I'm going to finally do an accent on screen and do some uh, like quite deep and visceral stuff with it as yeah. well. Um, so that's the next, that's all I know is the next step is um, Fringe. Um, I got a short with Velton and, and Jane, and then I got Blood Dip. But I don't know what's going to happen. My agent could turn around with some fucking audition. I land that. I don't know. But I, I, I try not to think about that. All I think about now is the present. Yeah. And that's, that's all that's helping me. And the presence is key, not just for acting, just life. Like you've got to be present. And that's what I'm working on because I'm still not there, man. You you must be the same. Like your head might go somewhere else. Yeah. And it's just staying focused. But that's that's the, the next thing for me is um, learning to be alone, learning to be at peace in my own company, and just become more disciplined. Mm. But enjoy life at the same time and not be so hard on myself. And that's all I'll say. This past year has been about. And I listened to my dad. Like he really gave me that advice. He goes, "Why? Like why are you putting so much pressure on yourself?" Yeah. And I've stopped putting the pressure on myself, and I'm enjoying my work. I'm really enjoying my work now. It's it's yeah. I've, I've been through so many cycles and transitions of life of what I want to be, but this one seems to have just stuck, man. It yeah. just ain't going. Like I can't get out of it. And yeah, it's a weird one. All right, now blitz around. You ready? Very quick questions, quick answers. Yeah. All right. Texting or talking? Talking, man. Cats or dogs? Raccoons. <laughs> They're better. <laughs> They're elite. O -o Otters, man. I love an otter. Uh, your one guilty pleasure? Stimulation. What makes you laugh? Dark, uncomfortable stuff sometimes. Yeah, I'd say dark comedy is one of the less, less, uh, right. that's my forte. What makes you angry? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things, man. A lot of things trigger me. Um, yeah, I can't. Driving in particular, I'm going to start writing a film about road rage and mm. uh, the different perspectives of it. Nice. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, I, that's one that's prevalent. I, I jumped out of my car the other day and nearly yeah. kicked someone's head in. <laughs> it was mental, mate. Like, <laughs> it, but that's, it's, it's a, it does something to you, man. Like, I lost my brother in a car accident, so mm. it's very primal thing for me um and that when your life's at risk like that it just i don't i, I don't think rationally and yeah i'd say that's one thing that really gets me angry driving probably the number one thing that gets me angry and pissed yeah. off uh, do you have any nicknames <laughs> i've been called hog man <laughs> Because I spent uh, months on end just k-holing on the floor, <laughs> snoring, <laughs> grunting, and like <laughs> uh, Matt calls me the goblin. I'm the, I'm the goblin, or like I'm just a little creature. Like I don't know, man. Is there a dish that you cook dish. best? I'll, I make a mean carbonara, but mm. it's not traditional style. Uh, yeah, that's sort of that's one of my forte's, I guess. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, book, video game, I series. I touched on it earlier. The anti-heroes, man, like the Patrick Batemans. I don't know what um, Denzel Washington's character's name in Training Day. That's the yeah. bollocks. So these guys that can make you love them, like um, James Gandolfini, Tony, Tony Soprano. Yeah, there's certain characters, and I'm like, this, they're so jaded and flawed mm. and. That's a real human being. Like a real human being has so many flaws. Yeah. 
and I can't stand the heroes normally. I look at them like, you're too clean cut. You're not real. <laughs> what do you prefer, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Oh, bro, I grew up on both, man. I, yeah. grew, I grew up on both, but Gollum used to scare the shit out of me. I'm more Star Wars. I'd say I'm more yeah. Star Wars because I'm more sci-fi. Yeah. Sci I love science. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, man. But I'd say, like, if, if you ask my daddy, he'd say Star Wars. I had the lightsabers and shit. Yeah. But as I've grown older, I'm, I think I prefer Lord of the Rings. I prefer the Hobbit to Lord of the Rings, and a lot of people don't like me saying that. <laughs> I really enjoyed the Hobbit series. It's one of my favorites. I like it. Yeah, I like it. yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? I don't do it now, but I always tell people I used to play the violin when I was little. Mm -hmm. And I, I got a, yeah, I got, I got a lot of love for classical music, mm -hmm. and uh, the reason I got into that was because um, we, um, my stepmom's uh, best friend was uh, the harpist with the Hungarian orchestra, and her husband was the lead violinist. Mm -hmm. And when you hear a lead violinist play a violin in the flesh, this close to you, it will break your soul, mate. Yeah, it will do something to you, and that was. Uh, yeah, that was it. Was a weird one because I got I used to get bullied for it a little bit and shit because it's it, it was different. It was different, but yeah. there's something about that. But yeah, that's it's not a talent anymore though because I don't do it anymore. But mm. I reckon if I picked it back up, I I pick it up. Yeah, like, yeah. How often do you cry? Every day, man. Yeah, no lie, no lie. The stuff we were talking about earlier, but sometimes it's not it's not for me. Like I'll be looking at something. Yeah. I allow myself to cry every single day. That's one thing that I've told my acting pals. It's, it's something that I believe as a practice um, because it, I don't know. I don't know if I've got control over my tear ducts now, but mm. I think I'm getting more control over them. I can flare them up. I can do something to them, but I need a trigger. Mm -hmm. And I've got folders of uh, stuff. I've got folders of things for tears, like songs, clips things that will move me, but I get moved on a daily basis, sometimes by my own subjective thoughts about what I'm going through. But a lot of the time, like I got a friend that's in a debilitated state, my mate Jack, and I listen to his music. He's a musician and I listen to his music and that makes me cry, man. And when I think about it, I'm nearly crying thinking about him right now. Mm -hmm. because he's just a good guy. And that's, that's a, a, I'd say the main reason I cry every day is empathy. Yeah, You've got to be empathetic to feel something. Yeah. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? Uh, my main thing is uh, social media. That's my main, uh, I'm addicted, man. <laughs> like anybody <laughs> who knows me knows that I'm on Instagram a lot. I'm not always posting, like I'm, I'm consuming stuff. And, uh, and and it's not doom scrolling anymore. Like it's doing a lot of good for me, man. And I'm, I'm making some good networks. So yeah, ARC25, ARC25 on Instagram. Um, that's You'll probably, find it in the description. Yeah, that's one of my, um, uh, yeah, that's my one of my main outlets, like network wise. So that's probably the best way to reach me and work with me. And it's it's, it's where I showcase my work, man. Yeah, nice. And the last thing, there is a segment called One Cool Thing. It's something that you really enjoy, and you think that viewers, our viewers, or listeners should try it too. Yeah, I wanted to be a scientist. I don't even want to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely, genuinely, I, did, I was studying science before I got my first modeling contract, but then. It was too demanding, man. I couldn't learn. This is why I couldn't learn lines because I was doing intense coursework, man. Mm -hmm. I was doing very intense coursework and learning a lot of stuff. And like, it was fucking hard. And I had to make a decision. I miss science so much every day. It, the, the, the sense of strength and power you get from knowledge, like looking over at a tree over there and understanding the exact chemical composure of the leaves and why they trigger. And I know why my heart beats mm -hmm. and stuff. Like it, when I think about stuff like that, it, Any particular it, sources where simple folk like me who don't know shit <laughs> could consume science? Crash Course. Crash Course is the fucking bollocks, mate. I love it. I started re-watching it again the other day. It doesn't just cover science. They cover everything like psychology and that. It's got cool little animations and that. Hank Green is the fucking boy, mate. And, and his brother as well, Rob Green. Um, they're, they're brilliant. They're so good. Yes. And I started re-watching them. Khan's Academy which has actually been recognized now by the, um, uh, but it, it got recognized by Barack Obama. And uh, I was actually battling with my course leaders because they wanted references. And I, I was like, I literally just watch YouTube. And I said, is my coursework all correct? And they went, yeah. And I yeah. went, that's all YouTube. Yeah. That's all YouTube because I'm, I'm a tactile and physical learner. I hate reading books. 
I hate reading books and yeah, Khan, Khan's Academy's one and the Organic Chemist. Those three channels, yeah, Organic Chemist, Khan's Academy, Crash Course. If you want to learn anything science related, it's the bollocks. It's interactive. Check it out. Yeah, Khan's Academy and the Organic Chemist is similar because it's almost like a, a blackboard presentation as they're talking, but the, the diagrams and everything is so easy to digest and it helps you understand things so much easier. But Crash Course is just fun. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun little mm. thing. It, yeah, yeah. Nice. Got a lot of respect for them guys. All right, man. Look, thanks so much. Yeah. It's like, I don't think we ever we ever sat down like this and had a conversation for two hours. No, nah, but we talked deep, man. We talked deep yeah. on many occasions. And yeah. this, this has felt very strange for me because I, I love conversation and the key to conversation is listening to somebody else and, and hearing what they've got to say. Yeah. And this has been very one-sided and strange for me. But at the same yeah. time, it's like, it strokes the ego a little bit, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit and you go, oh, I finally get to talk yeah. about myself. That's why I'm here. Yeah, I really enjoyed it, man. Thank you so much. No, same, same. Okay, right. yeah. if you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, uh, share your opinions on everything that we discussed in the comments and See you next time. Uh -huh. Big love. <laughs>